meeting to order. First thing is to review and approve the agenda. And I don't have a lot of changes to the agenda. I, I will say that I, well, I don't have any changes to propose for the agenda. Um, I just also want to observe that this has potential to be a long meeting. Um, so we'll just keep it, you know, keep it, uh, keep it tight. All right. Um, um, Madam Mayor, just yes. with regard to the agenda, um, it's not a big deal, but we do have two external guests. We have GMT coming mm -hmm. to talk about the My Ride. Mm -hmm. We've got the folks from Capital Fire Mutual Aid System to talk about uh, their plans. So I'm just wondering if we want to move those ahead of the COVID-19 update and, and accommodate our guests. Yeah, yeah that, uh, that's the a consent good agenda and the mm -hmm. appointment. Uh, yep, I like that. Uh, so if it's, uh, I know, Cameron, you're probably going to be here for the duration. So um, I'm just going to move that to the end if that's okay. Okay. Uh, Donna, yeah. I, I think it's great to move it, but I wish we would think about this when we made the agenda. I know there were people planning and I told them like that some of them were later in the evening, so they weren't mm -hmm. planning to come and join us. So the more we could be rational about this setup and think about that when we do it, it would help. Uh, yeah, the less we have to move things, the better. Uh, all right, so with uh, the moving of the COVID-19 update, anything else on people's radar to move? Okay, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. Um, so the next item is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you have um, something you'd like to say, if you would say your name and where you live and uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes, that would be fabulous. Uh, all right, so any, any um, folks want to address the council? So you can unmute yourself and uh, let us know or you can raise your hand. Um, either way is fine. Cameron, are you seeing anyone? No, oh, ma'am. Okay. Okay, then. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, the appointments to um, of uh, Montpelier High School students to uh, committees and boards. Uh, so I, I know we have at least one student here uh, who is uh, ready to, to introduce herself. Uh, Sophia, would you uh, just introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about your interest in the Conservation Commission? Um, hi, um, my name is Sophia Flora. I'm a sophomore at Montpelier High School. Um, I'm very passionate about um, climate justice and everything surrounding that. And this seemed like a great opportunity to actually you know, start making a change and working towards, you know, a better future in Vermont for sure. And so I'm really excited for this opportunity. And yeah, um, there is another girl from my school who's also interested in doing this. And she just emailed me to let me know that she can't make it because she couldn't get home in time. But she is also very excited about this as well. Cool. And just for context, um, I know you had both applied or want to be a part of the Conservation Commission. Uh, and I checked with the board chair to ask if, you know, if it would be okay if we appointed you both and that they, they said that would be okay. Um, so just for everyone else's information. Um, and then, so Al Althea is not here. Also, uh, Lorenza Fector uh, is applying to be on the Public Art Commission, but I don't see Lorenza here, unless I am mistaken. Okay. Um, any questions for Sophia? Okay. Um, is there a motion? Yes, Jack. 
Pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3, I move that we go into executive session to consider the appointment of a public official. Okay. Second. We got a motion and a second. Um, uh, all right. Well, we uh, hopefully we'll be right back here. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, well, we will be right back. So you can stay on the line and uh, this call will, will remain open. Um, so motion to come out of executive session. So moved. There's a second. Second. Oh, great. Um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? All right, is there a motion regarding the appointments? Yes, I'll, I'd like to make a motion that we appoint Sophia Flora to the Conservation Commission, Althea Torrens Martin to the Conservation Commission, and Lorenza Fle uh, Fetcher to the Public Art Commission Committee. I'll second. Uh, great. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Um, and just to be clear, these are these are student positions. Um, just so they're not confused with um, other regular regular positions. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, all right, motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, Lorenza, hello. <laughs> we disappointed you. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Yes. I am an Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is all good. No worries. Good. Um, and so we just have one other comment um, for uh, for Sophia. Uh, just based on your comments about um, an interest in climate change, we also encourage you to uh, look into the Energy Committee as well, which deals a lot with uh, climate issues. Um, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lorenza. Thank you, uh, Sophia and Althea. For, uh, for your willingness to step up. And so grateful that you're gonna be participating in our boards. Um, okay, so we are going to um, keep going then. Um, and I have lost my agenda. So this is gonna take me a second. Um, so I think the next thing yeah. was that it was either, was it the My Ride? next on the agenda. Th that is what's next? Yes. Okay, so to, I'm not sure who is, he, oh, Elizabeth Parker. Um, you do have to unmute yourself though. I know. Am, am I, is my oh, sound working? Jamie is, Smith is here. Sorry, but hang on one second. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, just for the students that just got appointed, you don't, if you know, we'd love to have you hang out and watch our meeting all night long if you're interested, but there's no reason to hang out. You're all set to go have something you'd rather be doing. <laughs> Hard to believe, but some people do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Bill, is there anything else you or staff want to say about this before I turn it over to? Um... Not really. In fact, there's probably council members that know more about this, but uh, we, it, we've we known that GMT and its groups in the community were working on, I think we were calling it, uh, what was it? We had not- My instant. ride. Yeah, it's called My Ride now. I was trying to remember what we were calling it before. Don't, don't remember. Yeah, we don't remember. We don't um, want to remember. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, and so we had asked for an update on where this project was and what was going on as it appeared it was about ready to roll out. So council members Casey and Bate have been our direct representatives, and Elizabeth is here from Sustainable Montpelier, and uh, Jamie Smith, I believe, is on the call from GMT. I'm here. Um. So I do have a, just a really brief presentation if folks are interested in seeing what the app looks like. I know that you're sort of pressed for time. So if you'd prefer that I just kind of go through where we are, that's that's okay as well. I I, uh, I think it would be great if we could see the app. Let's, sure. if you created a presentation, let's, let's do it. Perfect. Let's see if I can you should be able to share your screen now. Great, can you see it? Yes. Yep. Perfect. So. 
Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jamie Smith, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Planning at Green Mountain Transit. Um, so along with the My Ride Community Advisory Group and Sustainable Montpelier Coalition and lots of other community partners, um, we've been working on My Ride. So I'll just give a little introduction here. So ta-da, this is the welcome screen. When folks download the app, this is what they will see. Um, cute little picture of Montpelier in the background and a GMT vehicle. So for those of you who are not familiar with this service, it's a flexible route, flexible schedule service that will be coming to Montpelier uh, launching January 4th. Essentially, it's sort of an Uber for public transportation. Um, the hours of operation are similar to the services that we have now in downtown Montpelier. So Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., Saturdays from 8 to 6 p.m. Um, with the only difference being that, you know, folks can now pick, have a pick up and drop off location um, custom to their schedule and where they want to go. This is the, the MyRide service area. You can see the shaded top half of the map is um, the, the core of downtown Montpelier. The northern part is um, CCV all the way down to the airport. So this is about a seven and a half mile radius um, from downtown Montpelier. And then you can see a tiny little blip over where the Amtrak station is um, because that is covered in the, the MyRide service area. Uh, that top shaded half um, is the fare free zone. So right now GMT is operating fare free um, in our whole system due to COVID. Um, that will continue likely into the launch of this service, but when we do reinstitute fares, that bottom half of the map um, will be subject to a fare similar to what we have currently on the Montpelier Hospital Hill, which will be a dollar for a one-way trip. So folks who are using the MyRide app will input their location um, or their destination, depending on how they want to book their trip. Um, this is the screen that they will see. They can confirm um, that it's one passenger to however many passengers they're traveling with. Um, so this is similar to what they'll see. The far right hand screen is the, um, the, the actual trip and it will show you, you know, the sh that there's a short walk from here to the next stop or whatever information that folks need to be able to um, navigate the system safely. That information will be requested or shown right there, and then they can just hit that book this ride trip to schedule it. From there, it's similar to like uh, Google Transit, where it will give you some navigation information if the bus is not able to serve your um, immediate front door and you have to walk a little ways, it will tell you how to do that here. You'll know all that information prior to actually booking the trip. Um, similar to Uber down at the bottom, you'll see some information about the vehicle that's coming to pick you up, including the plate number. Um, we will be using the current fleet that GMT has right now. So, um, this will be really helpful for folks to be able to distinguish the MyRide vehicle from uh, regular um, vehicles traveling through Montpelier. Uh, there's a notification center that tells you, um, you know, if you've booked trips for a month, um, a subscription trip, if you're using this to get to and from work every day, this notification center will tell you um, your subscriptions are about to expire, you need to rebook trips, um, you have a, a MyRide pass that's about to expire. Any information, service alerts, um, if there's a, a dis disruption in the service or a delay in the system, um, and then credit notifications. So if you buy credits on the app, it will give you information here about um, how much credit you have left. So what happens if folks don't have a smartphone? Obviously, um, there are folks in the Montpelier area that will not be able to use the app. So for those folks, there are some, some options. Um, if they have internet access in a computer, they'll be able to book their trips right online. They won't need to use a phone. Um, if they don't have a computer, the GMT call center will be available um, for all of the service hours, Monday through Saturday, um, to help folks book their trip. Uh, they will be able to book their trips through the customer service representatives that are at the Montpelier Transit Center. 
And then we'll have, uh, to begin, we'll have a tablet station in the Montpelier Transit Center. Um, for all of you who know, in the midday, there's not usually a customer service rep at the kiosk. So we will have a tablet station there for folks to be able to go in and access to book their trips. And we all are also trying to identify other locations in downtown that would be useful for folks to have a tablet station. Um, but to start, we'll have it at the transit center. Uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot happening. <laughs> the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition recently conducted a week of onboard surveys and phone surveys with current riders. They rode uh, the Montpelier Hospital Hill and the Montpelier Circulator buses to talk to folks, um, gain some insights on technology um, capabilities that folks have, and just get some general feedback um, on, this, on this type of service and um, how folks would feel about that. There have been meetings and interviews conducted with community partner organizations. Um, in the recent weeks, the, the coalition, along with the MyRide Community Advisory Group, have been meeting re regularly. We have um, three subcommittees, a governance committee, current riders committee, and a metrics committee. So we're really trying to dig deep into uh, the back end of this service so we can make sure that we're not um, affecting current riders in a in a bad way. We want to make this service better for them, not worse. So we've been talking about that and what metrics would be important to um, report out to our partners. Um, so the other things that we've been discussing are the passenger feedback to date. Um, like I said, minimizing pass current passenger impacts. Uh, we've been talking about outreach and marketing to key groups of riders. We've discussed uh, the service structure, area, operations. Um, we certainly have been engaging community businesses, um, hoping that they will act as ambassadors of my ride to assist passengers who are out in the field. Um, I listed some here. So for example, Shaw's, Hannaford, Walmart. Um, so for folks who don't have access to a smartphone, we're hoping that the customer service reps at those locations will be able to assist passengers. Um, and then through the community engagement, we have discovered a cohort of current passengers who um, might need a little extra assistance, especially at the launch of this service. And so in response to that, the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition has been working pretty closely with the Montpelier Housing Authority. Um, and there will be some training and pre-registration sessions um, for these folks to make sure that they're in the system and they fully understand, um, you know, come day one when they need to start booking their trips, what they're going to do. And we're even going to try to um, assist them in booking their first week of trips so they don't have to try to figure it all out on day one. Uh, marketing and outreach. So this is sort of where we are at this point from now until launch. Um, Elizabeth and I will be <laughs> communicating quite a bit. Um, so we have been working on a pretty robust marketing and outreach plan. Um, there are some restrictions, boarding restrictions that we currently have on GMT vehicles. Uh, our small buses, um, we're only allowing nine passengers on board. So we're trying to uh, transition current riders to the new service without actually <laughs> asking uh, potential new riders to come on at this point. We want to make sure that you know folks feel safe, that our boarding maximums um, can accommodate the, uh, the additional ridership. Uh, we're working on a website that will be launched um, this week. And sort of behind the scenes, we're working on a toolkit of social media posts, press releases, front porch forum messaging, um, all the standard things that we will put out on our own, but also um, share with all of the, the community partners that we're working with. Um, hopefully, we'll launch the marketing campaign um, the week of December 14th. The app should be available in mid-December, but I think we all know how <laughs> app development goes. It might not be available until closer to the launch of the service, but we're hoping for mid-December. Um, so again, time loan, we're working on the marketing now. Um, December 15th, 16th, and 17th, the GMT staff will begin training. Um, we'll have a full simulation, drivers, dispatchers, customer service reps, um, using the system uh, in the field, testing it to make sure um, that come January 4th, we've got all the kinks worked out um, and we know exactly what we're gonna be doing.
So beyond that week of training, we'll be working with the MyRide Community Advisory Group to develop the toolkit of materials. Uh, we'll do some training with that organization um, for folks who have stepped up to become ambassadors at the service, training folks how to pre-register riders, um, et cetera. So then we're on schedule for a, a launch of January 4th. So that's a pretty brief <laughs> explanation of what's happening, but I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Thank you, Jamie. I um, have a question. That January 4th launch date, is that for current riders only, or is that available to the public? Or is the service available to the public at that point? The service will be available to the public at that point. Okay, great, wonderful. I am totally gonna use this. Um, Connor. No, I just, I just wanted to see, being on the committee with Donna, it's really exciting to see this roll out. You know, I think with COVID especially, like we pushed pause on so many of the big ideas, uh, but sustainable Montpelier is so scrappy they don't get like much noise, like city funding. Uh, and they've been like just great, like zealots, like saying, we're going to keep going. Uh, you know, it'll reduce congestion downtown. It's going to help our carbon footprint. And I think the more I talk to people, like low income folks in town, it's going to help them get to where they need to go without spending a fortune and maybe even reducing the need for a new car. Um, so I'm really pumped. You know, GMT has been like really responsive on this. And uh, I see Peter Kelman's on there. He's been like a Jack Russell Terrier on your leg, you know, <laughs> always advocating for the right thing. So, um, so, no, I just want to thank everybody involved. This is this is really exciting. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments? Yeah. I, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, go ahead, Morgan. Hi, um, Morgan Brown, uh, District Three resident, and I apologize for uh, previous meetings where I forgot to uh, uh, introduce myself. Um, so I have some questions for you, Jamie. Sure. Okay. So um, could you, would it be possible to put that map back up? Yes. Okay, good. So thank you. Um, so my question mostly relates to the portion of the map that's in the blue mm -hmm. here, that goes up to like hospital hill and all that so you had mentioned that um at some point the uh the fear will kick in for that portion of this ser uh, new service mm -hmm. and uh the my right and you said it was a dollar however right now well if the fears hadn't been um uh, uh, right now it's a you know free ride on the fixed routes and all that but but the the regular fear is a dollar before but it was 50 cents for people with disabilities and seniors and will the uh Will the portion in blue when the fears go, will that be the same? Yes, or it will. It, okay. Mm -hmm. The other question I have is, so when we had the fears, um, people that live in uh, Montpelier Housing Authority buildings, uh, the two, two uh, lane shops and Pioneer Apartments, they have a bus pass. And they can use that bus pass on Hospital Hill, and you know the other fixed routes within the capital district well will uh those persons in lane shops and pioneer apartment still be able to use their bus passes for the uh my ride in the where where there'll be the fair yes so we'll set residents up in the system to indicate that they're from lane shops or pioneer and when they book the trip or when the call center books the trip for them uh, they will just indicate that they're from those housing um, locations, and then we'll do the same thing that we do now. We'll bill Montpelier Housing Authority for those trips. So yes, okay. it'll, it'll work similarly. Okay, so it won't change in that regard. Correct. Okay, uh, one other kind of technical question regarding this: the uh, 
uh, in the past, even though we're using the bus pass, the housing authority would ask us, hey, if you're changing your routes and stuff, ask for a transfer because, you know, otherwise they keep getting charged and, you know, the transfers were available. Uh, this kind of does away with that in a way. I mean, um, you know, once, uh, you know, certain areas go to, uh, you know, fears, uh, it kind of puts a hitch in there, doesn't it? Have you thought about that? <laughs> so this will work similarly to the fixed routes now. Um, folks that are on the MyRide vehicle will still be able to get a transfer and they'll be able okay. to transfer to a, a fixed route. Okay. So so that doesn't change. Great. I'm glad you thought about that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth. I just wanted to make a short comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Oh my God. I haven't, I, I, my sound card didn't get fixed on Wednesday because Wes had to close. Oh, so I have to find a day to send it in. Anyway, um, it, it was very powerful um, doing the onboard survey. And I think that, um, uh, so Hanif Nazarelli, who's on Complete Streets and uh, MTIC uh, was part of that crew and our AmeriCorps volunteer, Tom Hubrickson, uh, also was one of the interviewers. Um, and we found a, a, a real range of um, interest and ability to, um, to make the transition uh, easily. Uh, so we identified certain people who, are, uh, who really rely on fixed schedule and are very angry that they weren't even considered in this decision-making process, they feel. Uh, and so we've been really working on building relationships with uh, those individuals. Uh, there are people who don't have any um, technology, as, as Jamie uh, described, and we're very fortunate that we have uh, Peter Yonke from VCIL on the group. He has some money uh, for people to get to actually um, be sponsored for uh, a flip phone or cell phone. Uh, and, uh, and then it ranges up to the people who uh, are college students who walk 10 minutes down Berry Street in the sweltering heat or the cold with a stroller to get on Hospital Hill to go up to the to the mall uh, to shop and have come back with heavy backpacks that they and they were so delighted that they could be picked up close to their home. And, you know, there, there are people who were like, oh, yeah, I can load the app. No problem. You know, so um, we're thinking about the one thing Jamie didn't talk about was that we're thinking about um, offering an incentive or a thank you for people um, uploading the app of doing a, a MyRide coffee mug and or Dunkin' Donut uh, gift certificate. So that's kind of, we're thinking about how to do that. But it's really exciting. There is so much. And then, then there are people who are solidly no, who after seeing us on the bus for a while uh, and talking and, and understanding it have gone to yes. So um, it's a relationship building exercise and it's very exciting. And if any of you know of someone who would benefit from um, uh, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistance on uh, adapting, getting registered and adapting to my ride? Please let us know at Sustainable Montpelier uh, because we're here to help. So thank you very much. Thank you. I so appreciate that you have put obviously a huge emphasis on um, ensuring that no one is left behind um, in this transition. And uh, that, that really comes through. And I, I think it's incredibly important and we're so grateful. Uh, any other comments, questions? I'm looking forward to this. I, I'm psyched. <laughs> this is gonna be how I get to work. <laughs> All right, thank you again. And looking forward to it rolling out. Uh, all right, so. Um, and Sophia, just in case you weren't here, we did appoint you to the Conservation Commission. Um, you, okay, you heard that, great, okay. Um, so moving on, um, I believe we have... Uh, so I was in such a rush to get to my ride, Madam Mayor, that um, Eagle Eye Council Member Richardson noted that we skipped the consent agenda. Oh, we skipped the consent agenda. Let's let's do that. Um, <laughs> And since I'm yeah. so excited about it, I'll, I'll be happy to move the consent agenda. Make I'll a motion. second. There's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? 
Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right. So we are up to um, getting an update from uh, Keppel Fire Mutual Aid um, and their dispatch projects. And I believe we have Scott Bag here from um, Keppel Fire, and, as well as uh, uh, Bob Gowans. So I, there's a few other people I think that haven't shown shown okay. faces, but I see some names that I recognize. So just to tee this up before the uh, folks get on and introduce themselves, I think would probably be the best way. Um, you know, we've been talking about dispatch systems and all this, and it came to our attention that Capital Fire was working on a project, which sounded interesting. And so the council, I think, a meeting or two ago, asked if they could come and update us on what was going on. And um, they very promptly got back to us and said they would be happy to. So we've scheduled them for tonight. And as I said, I think there's, I see Paul Srudi and Scott Bag here. I think Sally Dillon is on and probably a few others. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott or Paul, or whoever's gonna lead this and they can take it from there. And thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting us. Uh, just making sure everybody can hear me. I apologize for uh, wearing a mask. I am at my, uh, my full-time gig uh, working here at the hospital in the emergency department. And I was lucky enough to uh, break away. So please excuse the, uh, the gear, but it is necessary as everybody's aware with, in this time. Um, I do have a, a, a quick statement to give. I hope it'll only take a couple minutes, um, which outlines the project, if that's all right with the council. Go right ahead. Perfect. Well, thank you um, for the City of Montpelier for inviting us to, as the Communications Committee to your Council meeting tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce the members of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System Communications Committee. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Assistant Chief Sally Dillon. She is from Waterbury and is also a uh, public safety dispatcher for the state police. Uh, many, many years uh, experience, so she brings uh, a couple different roles to our committee. Next, I'd like to introduce Chief Paul Cerruti from the Woodbury Fire Department and Chief William Schwartz from the Marshfield Fire Department. Um, both these gentlemen have been instrumental um, along with all the other members of our communications committee. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name is Scott Bagg and um, I am on East Montpelier Fire, Northfield Ambulance and District 6 and have been a part of a uh, uh, fire and EMS in Central Vermont for over 28 years. So thank you for uh, allowing us to come forward. I want to call out in one last uh, recognition. I want to thank the Montpelier Police Department leadership and especially Supervisor Cummings for helping us with this project and to get to where we are today. So the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System was organized many decades ago with a purpose to coordinate services, supplies, and mutual aid responses amongst various fire departments throughout Central Vermont. Its members consist of fire departments, public service agencies through our region, with their representatives being the fire chiefs of these various agencies, including the City of Montpelier. In that spirit of cooperation, many fire departments, ambulance services, and fast squads have coordinated and come together as a group to receive dispatch services from the City of Montpelier Police Department, known as Capital West. This partnership has continued to grow, foster, mature, and solidify while it represents the very best of public safety integration throughout Central Vermont. Our committee and our departments look forward to continuing this strong cooperative partnership for the long-term future, for now and for decades to come. To accomplish notification of emergency responses to our various agencies, the Capital Fire and Mutual Aid System uses a myriad of towers, transmitters, and connections. These include the use of copper lines that have been in place since the 1980s, reliance on the uh, State of Vermont microwave system, and various repeaters to get signals to our towers. These towers are located in various areas of our region, including Mount Irish in Berlin, Waterbury, Woodbury, Walden, and Waitsfield. 10 to 15 years ago, it was identified that this patchwork of technology was decades old and desperately needed to be upgraded. This fact was then worsened by narrow banding of our frequency, which resulted in the decreased radio coverage of Central Vermont. 
Furthermore, our frequency that we use for dispatching has become significantly overcrowded. We share this primary frequency not only with our agencies, that being dispatched by Montpelier and Barry City, but emergency services out of Grand Isle County in Vermont and a nothing but boisterous Canadian taxi company. I can't make that up. There have been numerous occasions where our local responders could not be heard by our dispatchers due to that interference. This situation has blossomed into a significant safety issue for all public safety personnel throughout our organization. Because Central Vermont is within a certain kilometer distance of our international border, any change in our dispatch frequency would resolve, has to be taken and will take years to overcome. Our committee has worked with Burlington Communications, which is Vermont radio specialists, for years to investigate an open frequency that we could use and then apply for with both the United States FCC and in Canada, the Industry Canada, which is the Canadian version of the FCC, to apply for a separate frequency for all of our towers. Finally, our current system only allows transmissions and receipts of signals to each individual tower meaning that each of our dispatchers have a vast area of coverage, but they can only talk to one tower at one time. This means that agencies in our peripheral coverage areas, such as Waterbury or Roxbury, Thaston or Walden, may not hear, know, or be aware of serious incidents that are happening. This creates instances of interference with communication, lessened awareness, and decreased in safety. In May 2014, the Communications Committee of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System provided a report to all of our members and all of our departments, outlining that our radio technology desperately needed to be upgraded. Six years ago, this report was updated and provided to all these members, both in person and through the distribution of our meeting minutes. It outlined the committee's work to identify the challenges of our technology and then points of failure within our system and recommendations for techno technical experts at the Burlington Communications on how to fix this problem. The committee was provided a recommendation and a quote for a Motorola system upgrade. That quote was more than $1.4 million. Knowing that this was an exuberant cost that was way too expensive for our communities, our committee changed its focus to make small incremental steps to get closer to our goal while seeking alternative solutions. An example of this work is our continued transition to all ELAN circuits throughout our towers via consolidated communications. This past winter, our committee had the opportunity to meet and collaborate with various mutual aid organizations throughout Vermont and New Hampshire. We learned that a similar sized organization with a similar number of towers, departments, and topography had successfully installed a brand new Harrison Tate radio system at a price that was significantly less than what we were quoted. With the help of dispatch supervisor Fred Cummings, the committee was able to work with Burlington Communications to obtain an updated bid for Harrison Tate upgrade project. This bid was significantly less than before at just above $350,000. It was a cost savings of over $1 million. With this knowledge, the committee continued to work to determine how best to share the information, develop a plan and create a proposal. The committee presented all of our information at our meetings in September and November, and a plan was developed. This plan recommended that all agencies served by Capital Fire Mutual Aid through Montpelier Dispatching and Barry City Dispatching have one equal payment for all services. And that this payment would be spread over a period of 10 years, which would result in a cost of $2,500 annually. So you may be asking, what does this project do for us, the city of Montpelier? The project will replace and update all transmitters currently being used for fire and EMS dispatching by both the Montpelier Police Department and the Barry City Police Department. Furthermore, it will add an additional tower in Montpelier on Hill Street and a tower at the Barry City Auditorium. Finally, it will move the tower from the Waitsfield Fire Station to Mount Lincoln to provide better coverage of the Mad River Valley area. All towers will be linked via an E-LAN E-Line system and will be a voted simulcast system. 
This means that every transmission from a dispatcher will be simultaneously heard and transmitted throughout our coverage area on every tower. And that every transmission received from a responder on that system will also be simultaneously transmitted on every tower throughout the system. Responders will not only gain awareness of the system emergencies, but gain the capability to communicate vast and wide throughout our organization and region. This impact will greatly improve coordination and cooperation throughout our public safety agencies. And most importantly, we will be able to move to a new isolated frequency that will no longer have to compete for use and interference. As everyone can see, this will vastly improve fire and EMS communications throughout central Vermont at a very shared, minimalized cost. To upgrade each of our towers, it would cost roughly approximately $45,000 each. For a single town or city to accomplish this same increase in coverage, they would need to expend $25,000 to $30,000 more than what we are pr proposing tonight to cooperatively do over a 10-year period. In return, fire and EMS services served by Montpelier Police and Barry City Police will improve in coverage, capability, and safety throughout our system. Their responders will be able to coordinate and communicate with the other responders, no matter their location. The service area will have better notification power due to multiple towers simultaneously transmitting. And finally, we'll bring our aging technology from the 1980s to the 21st century. Sadly, there are some individuals that claim that our communications committee has developed this project without transparency or behind closed doors. Unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. The radio project and its progress has been reported, upgraded, and shared with every member of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System over a dozen times in the past eight years. The city and towns with the various departments have representation throughout our work. It has taken years upon years to get to where we are today, and we are energetic to be near the finish line and see our system that will finally address communication issues, challenges, and failures throughout Central Vermont. Our timeline is to complete agency commitments by December 2020. In this coming spring, we would obtain municipal financing through to allow project purchase of equipment. And we hope to be shovel ready by July 2021 with a hopeful go live date of Labor Day. To help in this process, again, we are asking each agency in their towns to serve and commit a payment of $2,500 annually for the next 10 years years. Again, thank you for the time of listening. Thank you for the time to let me read this statement. The rest of the committee and I are here at this meeting and be glad to answer any questions you may have. And thank you, Madam Mayor, for giving your moment of your time. Great. Thank you. That, um, that was very helpful and, and uh, very clear. Um, so just so that I am aware, are you... Uh, are you all asking us for a commitment of this money tonight, Mike? Well, we recognize that that commitment would not only take through uh, January, but also through uh, approval of town meeting in 2021. So there's no way to expect that fully commitment until the public gets a chance to vote, of course. But uh, the intent is to include in that budget in in the budgets and wait for uh, the various towns and cities approval. Uh, through the budget process that we'll have to have done this rate. Okay, thank you. That that makes sense. Um, I I would love to start by uh, getting comments on this from our uh, from our fire chief. Um, do you have any thoughts or comments? Sure. Um, it certainly is an exciting project. Um, I'm hearing a lot of this. I'm getting caught up to speed also, just like you are. Um, and I would, it would be great, Scott, uh, this is for Scott or Paul, if you could send out a, um, a plan, a scope of work. I, I have seen the um, quotes for the equipment. It would be nice to be able to review a, a plan and, and a scope of work that also includes the um, expected outcomes from the, I have not seen that yet. And 
and you know, and, and you know, before I could make a confirmed, you know, firm recommendation to the city about the project, I would like to see that and review that. Additionally, I have a, a question on um, the funding of the plan. The, the, the quotes I have seen are, as you mentioned, $351,000 to do the project. And the plan is um, to divide that over um, at $25,000 for 18 towns. So 18 towns would commit $25,000 over 10 years. That comes to $450,000. So is there a thought on the additional $100,000 what is not included in that quote from Burlington Communications is the equipment and setting up the ELAN uh, to the individual towers. Capital Fire has accomplished four of the eight towers, but an additional four towers would need to be connected via consolidated communications. And the cost of that engineering and connection can be up to ten to $15,000. That's some of the start, the small process that we have been over the last eight years to try to take one step further and further. So what the quote you have from Burlington Communications is a large part, but is not the total part of the project. Okay, so, so I think it would be helpful, especially for me as, you know, I prepare a recommendation for the city of Montpelier, that all of that is included. So we, sure. so that we can see the totality of the project and the funding that's gonna be involved in it. Sure, I've asked for those additional costs from consolidated communications and have yet to receive them, but we'll share as soon as I do. My hope is to get it in the next couple of weeks because I know this is budget time. Okay. Um, Bill, go ahead. Ed, uh, thanks, Scott. I just have two quick questions. One, um, could you send us the text that you read? Um, could you just email it to me or something so we have, we have your statement? Glad to. Yeah, thank you. And secondly, um, just more to Bob's question about cost. I'm just curious, you know, you're spreading this out over 10 years. Do, do those numbers include financing costs as well, interest rates and that? Okay. Yes, it does. And we also are committing that there will not be an increase to those costs to the over the 10 years. What what is the what we're asking for right now is going to be the same at year four, year eight. That, that will not increase, um, that the 2,500 is the total each year for 10 years. And Scott, on another question, um, does the vendor, I think it's Harris is the vendor, do they have any concerns with financing radio equipment over a 10 year period? You know, 10 years is a long time for. Uh, in speaking, sure Chief, uh, in speaking with the Burlington Communications and we ran this plan as a committee through them, which would be, uh, they're the, um, the technician, the company that is uh, through Harrison Tate. Um, they have no concerns with having a 10 year uh, payment plan and uh, with this um, financial plan. They had, uh, Todd at Burlington Communications had no concerns. All right. And Mayor, I think um, it's an exciting project that we should continue to explore and um and gather more information from the committee on some of our questions on um, funding and. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chief Pete. Good afternoon or good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Hello. Uh, I just, if I can also say this, when I got here, we've been, uh, I've been having these conversations. Uh, Fred Cummings has been giving me heads up notifications of this. I've seen the emails going back and forth, seeing what the quotes were. Um, I, I was prepared to, this would not be an additional $2,500 cost that we're gonna be adding, asking for in addition to uh, existing budgets. We're gonna find it someplace within our budget to pay for it, if approved. Okay, great, that's helpful. Um, any questions from council? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. I, I had one question as far as um, a commitment goes. Um, you know, we have limited uh, ability to commit. And I think actually Chief Pete's comment is kind of an interesting one, which is, you know, if, if in fact Montpelier said this is a great idea uh, and signed on to it and started uh, making payments, and 
out of the police budget, but then uh, five years from now, the police budget decides to cut back. We're not really using the system or against it. What's to stop us or any other town from uh, leaving this, this uh, commitment? That's a great question, Dan, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, we are working with uh, Paul Giuliani to come up with a, a language that could be a partnership between the 18 different uh, agencies and towns to help meet that. Commitment. But ultimately, if a city or town five years from now says, we're just not going to do it, I, I don't think that well, I, I'm, I'm going to be in my area of, I'm out of my area of expertise, and I would actually have to look at uh, you, you or the city council for a recommendation, but um, I would state that our towns and cities have uh, received dispatching in a partnership for a good 30 years, so I don't prospect that that would happen, um, but I'm not sure I have a 100% recommendation without getting Paul Giuliani as a recommendation for uh, from the Capital Fire Mutual Aid expect, um example. I'm sorry I can't come up with a better answer than that. That's, that's okay. That's helpful. And, you know, my, my concern is really, uh, I think, in a lot of these, in a lot of the, the partner towns where the budgets uh, come under, line items come under more scrutiny sometimes. Um, my concern is that if there is, for some reason, a political turnover in one or two or three towns, um, that can really leave, and it wouldn't just leave Montpelier in a, uh, a situation that would leave you um, and the other partner towns in a situation. I mean, we see this with the library, for example. Sure. If not, not everyone supports the library every year, even though it seems like something we all benefit from. Um, and that's certainly a concern in getting into this type of long-term venture where it sounds like you're not proposing to bond for this. It's really just uh, something Burlington Communications is willing to finance, essentially, um, this sort of delayed payment. And knowing how political winds change in 10 years, um, it's, it seems like a, a question that we may need more information on, or at least I, I would want more. The second question I have is, is as far as maintenance of the system. Um, mm -hmm. Would that be put into um, the CFMAS uh, budget? Or, I mean, would there be another expectation that we would be putting uh, additional money to maintain this system as a partner? No. Great question. The answer is no. You would not be asked for additional funds or monies for the uh, uh, maintenance of this. We have included it not only in the building up, but the annual, the monthly or the annual payment for ELAN circuits have been included in the cost for projection out the 10 years from consolidated communications. So there is no expected increase or for maintenance or upkeep of this system that that's all within this uh, project cost. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Scott, for uh, laying out so much information and all those in attendance. Uh, in dealing with the finances, I know Tom Galanka was very concerned, both as a Montpelier City Council member when he was here, as well as a board member of the Public Safety Authority, that financing was the one thing that's very weak about the Capital FAR mutual aid grouping in, in your bylaws. And so he always felt it was um, a weak spot of which the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority could support you in. And one of the reasons of which in sending Capital West membership was to help give you that because the authority can bond. And so we were surprised that we didn't know about this until, in fact, I asked Bill to bring this up because I wanted to know what Bill and Brian Pete knew because we didn't know. This, Public Safety Authority did not realize how far along you were with your vendor. In fact, under your guidance and members of your organization on the Public Safety Authority Board, as well as Barry and Montpelier, we went ahead with a large RFP because that's what we were told people wanted to do. Not just fix the equipment now, but actually do a full need assessment. And so we did that. And when you all came to our last meeting, October 29th, members from Capital West, 
Brian, members from Barry City, it was very clear that you no longer wanted to do that need assessment. In fact, you asked us to give you our money that we were going to spend on the need assessment to help support your equipment. So I'm, I'm just disappointed, I guess, that we couldn't use the resources to help strengthen what you need, but also look ahead whether or not in 10 years this equipment is going to be where we want it to be, how much of an upgrade it'll need or change. Um, can, can you talk at all about that? One is the financing. I mean, who actually signs the dotted line with Harris equipment? And two, looking beyond just the vendor's opinion, you had one vendor, this is their opinion to solve the problems versus doing a true inventory where all the towns are, what they have, what they need, and a bigger picture of where we can go with broadband, cellular, and not just radios. I think you hit on the, the, the point at the very final of your, your, your question there in that our focus is on public safety, fire and EMS communications. Um, we are not attempting to address cellular or broadband technologies, nor would we. That is not the, within our scope of our public safety, uh, nor in the mission of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System. We are, as a municipal corporation, uh, able to secure funding for this project and we have, uh, once we have the intention, I would say, um, and commitment is a strong word, but the intentions of the 18 towns to move forward, we will secure that uh, funding through um, uh, different avenues that we're pursuing to make sure that it's most cost effective for the 18 different towns. Um, I don't think that um, we, we're anywhere hidden that this is something we've been working on even before our joining of Capital Fire Mutual, or excuse me, uh, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Um, and I don't believe that we have ever asked for money from CVPSA. I, I, I'm a little um, perplexed on um, maybe, and maybe I misunderstood. So if I am, I apologize, but I know we are not asking for money from CVPSA. Um, I think that uh, we do have our members of the Public Safety Authority who are here, who can, were at the meetings, both in Sally Dillon and William Schwartz, who, if they would like to uh, provide feedback of what their um, input was over the last year or two, uh, I think we'd be uh, benefit to hear from them. Sally, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't recall Donna us asking for money for the equipment. Um, no, it, I'm sorry, it was just at this last meeting, October 29th, that it was very clear people felt it was a better use of the money to, to buy toward the, towards the, put this money towards the project ready to go versus doing a need assessment. So it wasn't from you, Sally. Okay. Sally, do you have anything do you want to add or Will, do you want to add? I don't think I have anything to add. I mean, I, I feel like, um, I know a couple of meetings ago, Donna, you had asked where we were at with our simulcast system. And I think I did say at that time that we did have a quote and we were working on it. And you asked what our future was with CVPSA. And I said, we had a meeting coming up. And at that time I didn't know, which was, was the truth. I did not know what our, our future was going to be. Will, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, maybe we don't have Will. Yeah, I'm not seeing Will. Uh, he was on earlier. He may have fallen off. I apologize. Here. Oh, there you go, Will. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, you know, it's important to remember that when Capital Fire joined CVPSA, the the intent was to see if we could get a single site dispatch center to fly. And, and for whatever reason, that never really gained a lot of traction in Barrie or Montpelier or, or really anywhere else. But it was, it was a good study. The needs assessment is, is very broad in scope um, with the cellular and the broadband and all that stuff. What, it's important to remember that 
what Capital Fire is, is really trying to do here, folks, is simply to improve radio communications. That's it. Um, cellular, broadband, all that stuff is, is, and Scott put it perfectly, it's, it's beyond what we do. We need to improve radio communications in our area, and we've been working on this for well over a decade. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, other thoughts or comments? Mayor, I had a couple more questions. If, if sure, go ahead. Can. Scott, and uh, it's again for you, Scott, and I apologize for not getting this to you earlier, but um, the, the plan calls for switching radio channels, which would require every radio in the in the district in capital to to be reprogrammed. Every portable, every every everybody's radio. Is there any money in the plan to assist with that, or would individual towns and cities be responsible for that on their own? Yes, we are developed, and I had I had asked this question by a couple fire departments a couple weeks back, and I uh, sharpened up the pencil to make sure that Burlington Communications maybe could provide a generalized assistance in um, in reprogramming uh, portable and truck radios to help with that. Um, now, Burlington Communications won't go to every 23 different agencies, but they are going to, and we're willing to uh, set up regionalized areas where if the department would bring them the radios at the cost of Capital Fire Mutual Aid, we would help get their program. There probably is a small amount of expense for um, individual departments that maybe may not can meet those regional, but those expenses would probably be very, very minimal as most of us have either whether Motorola, Kenwood, or similar radios that could be easily programmed uh, and set up. So yes, we have included some of our uh, funds into helping uh, program the truck radios and the portable radios. Okay, thank that, thanks for that. And, you know, and, and you know, managing an apartment that has 30 radios, um, there, there would be quite an expense there. And then my, my other question is, if not all 18 towns decide to join, mm -hmm. kind of it kind of goes to Dan's question, but if, if not everyone joins this now, what, what's the future of the of your, of your system? That's a great question. Uh, the 18 towns, if we, if we have one town or city that decides they just do not want to participate, we could um, get to the 17 towns and be able to make it work. It would be very tight, but we would be able to make it work. If two towns or cities decided not to participate, we would then have to cut back by a tower um, and uh, cut costs to make that work for the uh, towns or cities. We are not proposing that there would be an increase in what we're asking for. So we're not gonna be coming back in the spring and say, okay, I need another $500. That's not reasonable. So um, if multiple towns say, do they do not want to participate, um, we are going to circle back and come up with a better plan. But we are hoping that our work has uh, demonstrated that I think this is the best opportunity for all of our communities. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Anytime, Chief. Any comments or questions? Any um, of the public? Madam Mayor, Stephen Whitaker here. Go ahead. So I'd like to tie a couple of threads together here. Um, this council uh, voted uh, a motion some many months back to ask CBPSA to work closely with CV Fiber and explore the efficiencies that could be gained there. I have similarly encouraged that that planning be extended to the radio system. So this to be proposing or considering a system that doesn't go out to bid for radios, doesn't go out to bid for fiber circuits, uh, is questionable, uh, to put it mildly, uh, especially when we could potentially 
provide either primary or fail over diverse routes to these towers. As far as I've seen, and I've done extensive public records requests related to this project and, and see capital fire, no modeling of failure modes for what if an ice storm or a hurricane takes down one, two, three, or four of the eight proposed towers, who's going to be left with no ability to communicate? That kind of planning needs to be done. The uh, assertion that broadband and cellular have nothing to do with public safety is really not consistent with the National Association's trends and trade press, that much of what modern public safety, especially for responding officers, relies upon broadband for uh, locational awareness. If, if a man goes or a firefighter goes into a burning building and communications is lost, the type of cellular GPS that is used to try to locate that person. Uh, similarly, vehicle location, uh, video, pre-arrival, all kinds of stuff is going to require on require broadband and LTE, and that's why the CVPSA needs assessment is is properly examining the LTE coverage, the public safety LMR coverage, the radio coverage that they're talking about, as well as the. Uh, you know, broadband capability and fiber for backhaul. But this plan, in my review, is kind of half-baked in that it ignores several of the technologies that are emerging and necessary, and it has not been done transparently. Since 2018, I have been requesting the minutes and agendas and notice of meetings of this communications committee. I was told in 2018 at the end of an extensive public records request where I did get minutes of the Capital Fire general membership meetings that they acknowledged they had not been keeping minutes of the Communications Committee and that they would correct that going forward. Two years have passed. I've done additional requests and there are still no minutes of the Communications Committee. So this is a, and it's, it's worse than that. I've asked for the the financial projections of this expense and the payments. Um, these public records requests are being ignored. Um, I I don't. I guess I'd rather like meet privately with Dan and Donna and try to help explain how exhaustive. I've got a great paper trail how exhausted my efforts to shine a light on and try to persuade these folks to do a more integrated and inclusive planning process with CVPSA. And this entire radio system was, you know, done in the dark in this communications committee with no meetings warned, with no minutes, precisely while after the, the Capital Fire Mutual Aid had joined the board of CVPSA. So, to me, that's bad faith, and it has really poisoned the, the dialogue right now. So we, I also need the city council, the full council, to recognize that Montpelier, as the beneficiary of the revenues from Capital Fire member, members, over 300000 a year supporting our dispatch facility, has a, a vested interest, if not a conflict, in really honestly debating what kind of system we need, when, should it be competitively bid, or should we really get serious about a regional system that we, by clear, won't control, but will be a beneficiary of and may even operate. But it can't be a single site. It needs to have a failover option. And that kind of planning is initiated but not been completed. And part of the reason it hasn't been completed is because we've had this uh, effort to sustain the status quo, uh, maintain the status quo, no matter how deficient its planning or its transparency or accountability has been. So 
I, I'd be happy to provide more detail. I don't think this is the right form for it, but uh, you know how thorough and uh, tenacious I am, and I have my ducks in a row and my paperwork in order. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll suggest that you continue to ask questions and you possibly um, form a subcommittee, or you almost have one in your delegates to the Capital Fire, I mean, the, uh, I think if, if, if uh, Chief Gallants were to sit down with Donna and Dan and really examine what CVPSA is doing and whether or not there's hope to collaborate and or uh, get a complete plan before these decisions are made, um, that's probably one strategy to consider. I'll, I'll stop there before I insult somebody. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Um, uh, Jack, go ahead. And then if um, anyone would like to respond um, uh, to those comments, that's fine too. Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad Steve was here because he uh, knows more about this stuff than, than I do. But I think he, uh, he, put together some of the thoughts that I had, which is that this, uh, this moving forward with this plan doesn't seem to address the issues of, uh, of fragmentation of services and uh, not covering the whole range of uh, emergency uh, communications that, uh, that the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority is uh, is trying to address. And so I, as a total amateur at this stuff, as most of us on the council are, <clears throat> I really don't know how to evaluate uh, what we should be doing. Um, $2,500 a year for 10 years seems like what we can find from the couch cushions if we really uh, needed to, and so that's attractive for for the price alone. But on the other hand, it seems as though we are uh, we're not addressing some of the real needs that that we have. And so uh, I don't know who we should be getting the guidance from. I would like to uh, have. Uh, CVPSA is part of this conversation. And of course I would uh, rely heavily on the expertise of, uh, of, our, uh, of our departments in Montpelier uh, as, as we think about how to go forward. But so I don't have an answer, it's just questions. Fair enough, thank you. Um, would uh, Scott, uh, Paul, uh, Sally, I'd like to um, address any of the comments that were made. I believe, yeah, I believe Mr. Whitaker and um, our committee have differences of opinion. Um, and some of those comments that Mr. Whitaker has said, uh, even as recently in the Times Argus, have, uh, well, they say it for themselves. I think our focus is not on that. Our focus is on really trying to improve fire and EMS communications. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in a room that my lights just went out. <laughs> there we go. Um, we, we are not gonna be able to reach broadband or GPS or those, those services. We have communities that have no cellular coverage right now um, and the to accomplish that is a lofty goal, something that we're not against and we're not preventing for an evaluation and the RFP to to consider that. Um, we're not recommending against that. But what this does do is it focuses on what our members, our firefighters, our EMTs need now. And that is an improvement to our current system and moving it forward. And I think that's where we've worked very hard and diligently to come to. Um, and we have been coordinating this with uh, police department leadership, dispatcher supervisor um, Cummings, um, and our committee have really been focusing on how to improve 
the radio infrastructure we have now, not necessarily uh, what could be there in 10 to 20 years, but what we need today to make our, our responders both capable and safe. Thank you. Uh, Bill, go ahead. I just have a question. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm like Jack, I don't really understand this stuff at all. And, and I'm not even sure that it needs, or, or anyone can answer this right now, but I'll throw it out for people to think about. Does, let's say that we went forward with the plan that, that's been presented tonight. Does that preclude the other opportunities? In other words, um, could, could it be improved or enhanced in the future to include the types of things that Steve and others are talking about? Um, or is, this, is it sort of an either or? No, we, I wouldn't imagine that it would be in either or, that it looks at where we are currently in the recommendations of bringing our, tel our technology to today. I cannot predict what technology will be in five, 10 years and how that can vastly improve communications, uh, both public safety and public communications throughout. Um, but our system will it will be adaptable and able to grow to those new technologies when it is. It is not an either or, nor are we recommending that this project be an either or to the work that CVPSA is doing and the RFP that they have. We're not, we're not recommending against that. Matter of fact, we see that there could be some strong benefit to that. Um, and looking at all the various different capabilities and communications out there. Uh, so this certainly can be adapted and can be grown upon, uh, both as a uh, for our communities and if any other communities want to join us as well. May I speak? Um, yeah, I'm going to let our our um, actually go ahead, Paul, and then we'll get to. Um, I'll be Jesse. short. Just speaking from someone out in the woods. One of my problems with Mr. Whitaker's thing is that it. We have no cell towers. The communities we cover have no cell towers. We have no LTE, ITE, NETE. Um, when I walk out my door, I no longer have cell coverage. So any system that relies on uh, cellular or anything that requires data um, simply will not work for us. Um, talking to AT&T, who's the vendor for FirstNet, for the cell service, uh, we're not even on the radar for the next 10 years in our areas for cell coverage. So, so speaking from out in the woods, I just don't see that as an option. And I, and I would uh, reiterate the same thing Scott said, as far as governance or who operates this system moving forward 10 years, um, someone else could drive the system, it still would work. Um, or could it be connected to some future technology? I think yes. Um, you know, and what I like to say sometimes is sometimes we let the perfect become the enemy of the good at, at this point. Um, it's like we're driving around in almost a 40 year old car and we're saying, well, it'd really be nice to get a car that's going to be 10 years away, but the car we have now is broken. And speaking in our area, we have major lapses in coverage. Um, there's there's uh, um, problems uh, for us many times with uh, dispatchers are very busy and having to switch towers. And so transmissions are sometimes, this is not meant as a bad comment or the dispatches, but if you have to constantly switch between eight towers, uh, there's huge gaps for problems. And as a fire chief, you know, I, I go by the Gordon Graham saying predictable is pre preventable. Um, if you can predict that a disaster is going to happen, then we can prevent it happening. This does that in our radio communications. And it's a really big deal to those of us kind of on the outlying areas where where if they use the wrong tower by accident, we simply miss the tone. We don't get the call, or I have 11 firefighters that don't show up. So it's not, it's not uh, um, what could happen is what does happen sometimes. I'll get a, to the station, there's just me. And then what happened, oh, wrong tower, turn it again, and then you're, you're seven or eight minutes behind. And as we all know, fires don't wait for us, or EMS calls don't wait for us. So, so I really would encourage the board to take a look at this in what it's trying to do. It's trying to fix our current problem. Um, and, and I don't think it makes it so we can't morph to something better or, or alter this in the future. I don't know, I'm not an expert in this field. Um, and for, for relatively low cost, and I was quite pleased about the low cost. But anyway, that's all I have, and then I'll turn my mic back off again here. Thank you, Paul. Um, and go ahead, Chief Pete. Thank you, ma'am. It just, uh, you know, 
there, there are technical uh, aspects to this and you know a few articles reading a few articles here and there about what the locations are doing um, there are ge ge geographic challenges to some of these things and the other part of it is like as far as like broadband and, and that type of technology it's not something necessarily that this the municipality can control that's that's entirely up to as far as like how that coverage is going to come into play where if there's a if there's a way right now it's not feasible to look at things like lte or those types of broadband systems to do this type of radio because of the hilly terrain that we're in um, so when and if that technology improves to the way that's going to be extremely reliable to what it is that we're doing uh, the other part of it is we have no control over whether AT&T, Verizon, uh, any of the rest of those, those service providers are going to bring that coverage up. There's nothing that we can do to control or to manipulate that. Thank you. Uh, okay, any further uh, questions about this? Obviously, we're um, going to need to talk about it again, but um, any other questions for right now? Uh, Madam Chair, may I offer a couple of clarifying comments? The, this is Steve uh, Whitaker. The, uh, very briefly, go ahead, Steve. The, the economy of scope, uh, there's some clear misunderstandings. Virtually none of the folks that are speaking and promoting the Capital Fire radio plan are experts in this technology, and they've all, all admitted so. So they're entirely reliant upon consolidated communications as a sole source vendor and Burlington communications as a sole source radio vendor. And that is reason why CBPSA having an independent engineering firm without any vested interest in selling any equipment who does understand cellular. The, the, the belief that we don't have anything to say about cellular deployment is absurd. In fact, there is a, um, CV Fiber had already paid an engineering firm to do a broadband, wireless broadband plan for Central Vermont infill that would include LTE coverage. And so it, it's well within our grasp to fill the dead zones in the cellular canopy. And not only that, to achieve significant cost savings by aligning the fiber use, the backhaul the fiber that's needed to get to these towers for the simulcast system might be the very same fiber, likely would be the very same fiber that's needed to hang small cells for LTE coverage. So this is where we can't afford to, you know, add everything as a change order to a, a capital fire half-baked design in order to get this rest of the system built out. We need to design it and build the efficiencies in from the start. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, any other final comments from folks? Just thank you, Madam Mayor, for us and asking a lot of good questions. We certainly are going to continue to work with Chief Pete and Chief Gowans to finalize and come up with more information. And uh, Chief Gowans, I plan to reach out uh, tomorrow and. Uh, see if we can uh, answer all the questions as best I can. Great, uh, Jack, go ahead. One last thing, I, I appreciate the presentation that we heard and uh, when we get this in writing, uh, I suspect I'm not the only person who would find it helpful to have, uh, have it accompanied by a glossary that tells us what all the initialisms and other uh, technical terms mean. I think it's important so that you understand what what the money is going for and not be covered by technical uh, wizardry or whatever the words may be to really to bring it to uh, the knowledge that everybody can understand so that you can make a sound decision. That's certainly reasonable. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this is being done at all to uh, to snow us or uh, or just put something through. It's just that when you're dealing with a field and every every technical field has its own vocabulary and people who aren't in the field don't uh, don't know it, know the vocabulary. And so that'd be helpful. Thanks. Sure, John. Thank you. All right. Well, and thanks again. Um, that was that was very helpful.
Um, all right, well, um, so we're gonna move on. Um, um, by the way, I'm anticipating taking a break at 8.30. I uh, hope that is um, soon enough for folks. Um, so for this next uh, item, sorry, I know it's kind of a hard gear shift, uh, switching topics. Um, but uh, yeah, so for this, for this next topic, um, uh, the Confluence Park grant application, uh, I think I'm turning it over to um, Kevin Casey, unless Bill, you have anything you want to add first. Uh, yeah, I'd like to turn this over to Kevin Casey. <laughs> <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Um, we, uh, we are um, asking tonight to actually for a sponsorship for an application to uh, the Land Water Conservation Fund to fund the next phase of the Confluence Park. Uh, as you recall, Ricarda um, Erickson did a presentation for you, I believe it was last year, um, with the conceptual designs and council uh, liked one that was called Concept E. Um, and I actually have that here if you want to refresh your memory. Um, but, you know, we recognize that, you know, with, with all of the budget constraints of what's going on now, committing to another project, um, even though you already have committed to it in the past, um, and it's priority project that, um, that, you know, there might be some trepidation. However, one of the good things about this grant application is that there's plenty of flexibility in identifying a match. Um, we met again this morning and um, went through uh, the potential funding sources and we're making contact, getting letters of support. And I actually don't think that it's gonna be too uh, big of a stretch to get a good portion, if not all of the money from multiple partners, um, from small to large. Um, so this is uh, one of the things that we discussed with Bill and Kelly was that um, this is, it's, it's a, it's right to, to apply for this right now for a number of reasons is that one, you know, it's, we're applying for $300,000, which the city would have to match. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where the other partners come in is that we can come up with the money, um, to move the project forward. Uh, there's a fair amount of excitement and a fair amount of, um, of support from, uh, the folks who administer the, the grant. Um, and VRC is, uh, has done a lot of the heavy lifting. Steve Libby and Ricarda have um, really done a great job um, getting everything together. So we're just looking for a kind of continued support to move this project forward. Um, I'm excited about it because after I go through all of the potential grant funding sources for this, uh, I like I like what I'm seeing. We've got the, the conceptual plan, which is a great start. Uh, the, the LWCF funding will help phase, will help fund the second phase. You know, I'm sure you hear from Mike all the time, you know, plan, prepare, implement. And so we've done the planning on the conceptual side. So this is the preparing side. So this will help fund things like the engineering, um, final design, cost estimates, that type of thing. Um, and then we get into implementation and, you know, I'm looking at some of the funding sources and, uh, you know, I think we can get there as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free. We just need the resolution signed. Uh, I don't, I don't know how that works now with zoom, but, um, I, I attached it tonight, uh, with the, the application is due on the 14th of December. Um, and we're, we're well on our way. So um, if you have any questions. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you for that explanation because um, I certainly had a little sticker shock when I saw that, um, but knowing that it's not necessarily coming out of our general fund is very helpful. Yeah. And, um, oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say no. there's the recognition that this is a, you know, we're probably three to five years out from, um, from, you know, actually shovels in the ground. I mean, you, even when we look at it is that even if we were to get the funding and um, uh, approved, you know, we'd be in the planning stages next year um, and, you know, procuring a, uh, the next phase of engineering and design 
So there would be some money spent next year uh, with the 50-50 match, but we're not talking about the, you know, 600 to a million dollars that we would need to commit for implementation, you know, next year. So we're a few years away. And that's one of the things that we kind of thought was, look, a lot of communities are holding back for this very reason, but we know that like this is a, a priority project. COVID isn't going to last forever. And if we can get our foot in the door and get uh, get a good head start on the, the planning and the preparing stages, you know, we're, we're going to be in good shape when and if, and hopefully this ends. So um, yeah, I think we're, I'm excited about this one. Cool. Um, Donna, go ahead. Uh, Kevin, you answered part of the question. You said four or five years out for shovel ready. Is it indeed when the grant comes, it would arrive? When would we know? When would it, when would we have to start? It's like, how long is it alive? You know, how do you, do you have, how much time do you yeah. have before you spend it? All of that kind of timeline. Do you have any well, we're, things? You no, know, if that's part of the, that'll be a part of the application process, what our timeline is. But because this grant helps to fund the, um, the like design and engineering phases, it's pretty well recognized that, you know, you're looking at for something like this along the river, you know, you're a year to 18 months from procurement of a contract, you know, from a procurement of a, of an engineer to, to completing a final report to, you know, reviewing the, um, the, the cap and making sure that we have everything in place. So it, it fits within the time frame, you know, three to five years, I'd like it to be on the three side. Um, you know, and I think that's reasonable considering um, the energy behind the projects. Uh, and, um, you know, I think the only thing that's going to come up is that railroad. Um, but we're, we're going to uh, have you in the minutes is guaranteeing no general fund money, okay? Uh, but well, now, when, yeah. when would you uh, actually know? When would you know if you got it or not? Steve, is it January that they... Yeah, I, I think they make the, uh, the the review process is during January, either late January or early February. Uh, I'd have to go back and look, but it's a pretty quick notification timeline. I mean, to be fair and not to be cynical, but I'm going to be, is that just the length of time it's taking the state right now to get our grant agreements processed. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to give an example, uh, we had uh, the accessibility modification grant at um, the Kelly Hubbard Library. That took almost a year just to get the grant agreement. And it's just, just waiting. And, you know, COVID was a big part of that, but there was also just, um, you know, they're shorter staff. And I think that that's just where we are. So I'm not particularly concerned that, you know, we get an award letter and then we will get a grant agreement within a week. I, I've never seen it. So, um, just me being cynical again. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. Well, and, uh, if, if it really came down to it and we were awarded the grant, but we really couldn't find the money anywhere. We don't have to accept the grant. Uh, that, I mean, yeah, that would be the other option too. And I and I, I think Steve, were you telling me was it what was the other community? Was it Randolph or somebody else that actually got LCWF funding and could not come up with it and actually turn the grant back? Was it you or it, it wow. wasn't me? It wasn't me, Kevin. I, um, you know, Some, we've had we've had a couple other projects, smaller ones in smaller towns, where we worked with the municipality on LWCF funding yeah. and both of those were successful. So I, um, yeah. I, but I don't know about, you know, I'm sure there's procedures for if you just can't meet the match, which I, again, I agree. I think this is a very attractive project from a whole yeah. bunch of different funding perspectives. And to be fair, is that like, I think that I could, um, I could rattle some doors to get the planning and engineering funds. Um, from the other partners. I, I think that there's enough um, interest and uh, energy around this that 
Um, if we had to come up with additional monies on the front side, I, I think we could find those matches. Um, so like if we're, you know, we need to come up with $50,000 pretty quickly. I don't see that as too much of a challenge. Um, I think it's, I think it's out there. Um, um, thank you. Uh, Jay and then Lauren. Sorry. Um, obviously, I think it's important for me to, to mention that as, if you haven't figured out, Ricarda, who's been mentioned as my wife, um, in terms of just, you know, full disclosure here. Um, obviously, I'm very familiar with the steps of this project. Um, and at this point, I feel comfortable um, being part of the conversation and part of the vote in terms of sort of moving it forward. This certainly is, is nothing that we stand to gain any sort of financial gain from or is not, it's, um, you know, her work with VRC. This is just a part of her work with VRC. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, I, I wanted to put that out there if others are uncomfortable with it. Um, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that conversation or, or your thoughts, but just, um, just want to make sure that, you know, sharing that and, um, this, this project and this type of project, I think is very important for the future of Montpelier. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable being part of the conversation right now, but just wanted to, um, uh, if, if there was a, a thought in terms of uh, recusing myself for um, any vote that might happen tonight. I'm happy to hear those thoughts too. Well, Jay, I was not thinking it. <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable. Unless other folks have um, comments, questions, or concerns about that. And I think this project preceded your time on the council, didn't it? The city already committed the. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Far. Uh, far yeah. Far preceded, for sure. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> But thank you for bringing it up, um, nonetheless. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, I, I'm really excited. I feel like having like positive and optimistic things to look forward to for the city right now is, is great. And I'm so excited. It's not just being put on hold, but moving forward. So thanks for the work and keeping it going. Um, my only question was, um, do you know if, if like we do this LWCF grant now, um, is there opportunity for implementation LWCF dollars or would this kind of be, is it like a one shot and you're, you probably can't get future funding just knowing like they just, you know, expanded like the Great American Outdoors Act and obviously the Trump administration has not uh, moved forward with it, but the new administration might. Um, so there, if there could be more funding in the future, like would love to make sure we're maximizing whatever opportunities there might be for both planning and implementation. So I was just curious if you knew anything about that. Well, I think that, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but the, these funds are going to kind of cross over from planning to implementation, potentially, like, you know, depending on where all the other funding sources come from and how that all, all works out and what the actual cost estimates are. Um, that this can, that one of the advantages of this is that it can be used for the final design and engineering. That's the one thing that we always run into is that there's plenty of planning money for the front end of doing conceptual planning, but that middle stage of we need to find money for engineering and um, final design and the, where you start spending money um, isn't there for a lot of projects. Um, and um, so this is that's one of the reasons this is attractive. It just can kind of carry through that. Um, you know, we met today and we identified some other opportunities. Um, so that I'm following up on things like accessible, ex accessibility modification grants through CDBG, um, which we just did one at the library. This, this would, would fit the bill. It's a city owned facility. Um, and it is, uh, um, you know, this will make, this will modify it and give river access to, uh, people with disabilities. So, um, you know, that would be one opportunity. Then we have opportunities for, um, you know, recreation grants and then small grants for boat access. And, um, you know, we identified probably in excess of 10 or 12 funding sources, different priorities, you know, that, that we 
where we think we'll get money, but um, I'm encouraged and I, I, you know, I, I'm not always one to, to think that the money's there or that, that it can be so quickly done, but I'm, I feel pretty confident on this one. Any further comments on this team or is there a motion? Oh, Lauren, go ahead. One question. Do you, do you have a good sense of how likely we would be to get it? And is anything like a letter to our congressional delegation who has a lot of uh, appropriation sway and loves LWCF deeply, um, it, you know, is, is anything beyond yeah, um, from us to in encourage or provide? I'll let you know. I, I you know, we, in, in the past, what we might do is ask, you know, Anne to write a, a letter. We'll prepare one, and, and 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 so that we can, you know, kind of demonstrate that the city is um, uh, uh, supporting this. I mean, there's a resolution which says that you're supporting it, but even that letter of support is is great. Um, we'll, we'll always take those. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't. Uh, Alec has had conversations with Jessica Savage, who manages the grant, and there has been pretty good energy around it. Um, so he's been pretty, um, uh, pretty confident going into it that that's it's well received. Steve, do you have anything to add on that one? Uh, <clears throat> no, I I think they're. Um... It, to go back to Lauren's initial question, these are really our implementation grants, and they allow for the pre the you know the planning and engineering as a as a allowable cost. So it really is the assumption is that you're coming in to to build a project, um, and the magnitude of the grants um, you know reflect that. So I think it, as Kevin said, this is really a kind of a, you know an, an unusual funding situation where the implementation grant actually will pay for some of the front end work. Um, so I, I think that's a, a fair, fair way to represent it is really is an implementation program. Jack, and then I can add something too uh, after Jack and Don. Okay, sounds good. A wise person told me one time, and it might have been Bill, it might have been Mike Miller, that uh, one of the things that uh, one of the things we look at in, in this job is to going forward, think about what ribbon cutting and uh, groundbreaking you wanna be at in five years, because we have to start on that path now if we wanna be there. And I think that- uh, <laughs> I mean, that was my- Yeah, that's not- The ribbon cutting um, to something that will be such a great uh, benefit to the city center when it happens is is going to be tremendous and i think we uh, want to be moving in that direction now well and thanks to uh steve and ricardo we're already a year into that five-year path towards the ribbon cutting so we're we're in uh we're in good shape so jack is that a motion i can second Yes, I move that we uh, approve this. I second it. Fabulous. Um, uh, Alec. Uh, I was just going to add to the question of how likely we are to get it. Um, the city has not gotten any LWCF funds in a long time, and I know sometimes the state has a hard time giving money to Montpelier with these things, but... Um, I think the last time we might have gotten those funds was maybe for the rec fields, uh, which was a long time ago in the 90s, maybe. Um, and we they actually turned us down a couple of years ago for a separate project. So maybe they're feeling bad about that, too. Um, so just based on that history, I think that improves our chances. OK, well, we have a motion in a second. Is there any further discussion? Can you take it one more? Can you take a question? Sure. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, uh, Steve Whitaker. The, are we are we defining the scope? Are we constrained by the scope? Uh, if and when the garage project falls apart, uh, can that that Confluence Park was almost a token gesture, and I think that we have a bigger opportunity here that we may be looking at now. And I w I'm hoping that this 
application won't constrain uh, our opportunity or imagination to uh, expand the scope of this um, in the next year or two. So I just want to make sure that we're not locking in something uh, that was had a different agenda when that, the size of that confluence park was crafted. Um, thank you, Stephen. And just to clarify, um, to my recollection, the Confluence Park project predates the hotel project. Um, any other comments or questions on that? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, super. Thank you so much for your continued work on this. Um, I look forward to being at that ribbon cutting, maybe. <laughs> uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, uh, Reminder for the council that this is a resolution that needs to be signed. It's not yep. only electronically, so we'll probably be pestering you to figure that out. Uh, yeah, so I sent it along. Um, I sent it along with the with the paperwork to Mary, so it might be attached. Now Mary, Mary will be badgering you, but this one will actually require uh, probably a visit to this. Uh, mm. Close, we'd have to, you know, set you up for getting. Okay. Back. We'll make it happen. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Um, it is eight twenty three. Um, I think it's probably time to take a break. Um, so I'll see you all in about 10 minutes. Awesome. Um, so like 8.33 ballpark. <laughs> see you soon. A, a discussion of 12 Main Street, possible acquisition. Uh, uh, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Hopefully this won't be too terribly complicated. We've talked about this a few times. Um, we're trying to refer to the property as 12 Main as opposed to, you know, Moat or TKS or something there. Those are the former owners. <clears throat> as you know, the city purchased uh, the three properties from, from the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Moat and TKS as part of the One Taylor Project to, for the bike path and the road access into the back parking lot. At the time of the purchase, we had negotiated uh, a a buy and sell, so we would be buying the Moat property and Moat would be buying the TKS property, which we had purchased previously. And all this money had been purchased with federal funds through our, our grant project for transportation purposes. Um, in order to, to execute the sale with Moat, uh, Vitrians had to declare that portion of the property as non-essential to the project. We were on board with that because we wanted to execute the sale. We were looking forward to a, a private development building there, and it was our way to uh, move the project forward. Literally, it was either at the closing or the day before the closing, uh, very close to finishing it, uh, Moat Trust said, you know what, we think we'll just sell you our property at the appraised value and not do, not do this double you know, buy and sell. So that was fine. That allowed us to pr still purchase their property, still stay on, on track. However, um, that meant that the property, the, I can't really call it the former TKS property because we've since reconfigured them. There were three lots, now there were two. Um, but it was always clear that any sale would require a repayment to the state um, for the, the, sh the federal share that had been put in for 134000 um, some of you may recall that a, a then there was a, a discussion ensued about what to do with this property since now we didn't have to build a building. Should it be open space? Should it be something else? We convened a group to talk about it and that ultimately got folded into the downtown master plan. And at all times it was clear that this repayment needed to be made that even if it were going to be built into a, a park and it, in fact it was even considered as sort of a, a confluence park on this side of the river as well to complement the one where we just talked about. Uh, and it was always clear that if that were to happen, you had to, uh, you know, put this extra money into the project to pay off the state. Um, and so, as some of you may recall, around late January, right at the end, we had just finished our budget process, unfortunately, or it might have been the last night. The state said, you know, it's been enough time. We could use the, the money back to, to, uh, 
match you know federal funds and, and understandable that they're not you know they're acting in good faith here too so they had given us a deadline of actually yesterday december 1st to uh, pay our share in full or make some other decision and as you recall the decisions were the city could could pay what's owed in full and then we would own all interests in the property going forward whatever we would have full control over what was used if we chose to sell it uh, privately there would be no strings attached we would uh, keep any profit or loss um, for the sale of that property. Another choice was to sell it in conjunction with the state. So they would put it out to a bid through a public process and any proceeds over the 134 would be kept by the state. Any sale that was under 134, the city would bear that have to pay the difference um, you know, for any loss to, to the state to make sure they stayed whole. So in that case, we, we had the risk of the loss, but no benefit of the gain. And then the third possibility was to just let it lapse to the state and they could do whatever they saw fit with it, uh, sell it themselves or, um, or put in a state facility or, or, or do whatever they might see fit to do with it. Um, presumably something transportation related uh, since it was purchased with state transportation money. So you, the council, uh, we talked this, I think in June, and you expressed the preference for us to buy it and to see if we could figure out a way to do so. Uh, as you recall, it was also in the middle of the COVID and you know, the thought of us coming up with $134,000 to do this was daunting, but at the same time, it seemed like a good opportunity to own and control the process. So we've been back and forth with the state about this. They, you know, I think work, we work cooperatively with us and ultimately they, they said to us that they would uh, allow us to split the payment over two years. And rather than it being due, the first one installment being due yesterday, it would not be due until June 30, as long as it was within this fiscal year. So at some point in this fiscal year, we would open the first half, they would not charge interest. And um, the second half would be due during the next fiscal year. So sometime before June 30, 2022. So it's a two payments of 67,000. Uh, so we've built the second payment into the, the proposed budget for next year. Um, and the first payment we would have to find under our current funds and um, monitoring that. So, um, but we think we can do that, uh, as, particularly since we would be purchasing an asset. So it's our, you know, that's the base, the background. Those are the issues. It's my recommendation that we move forward with this arrangement that the state has provided and that you authorize me to make the final negotiations and then make that happen. But we're certainly happy to answer any questions uh, and any comments. But again, I think, I know we've talked about this before. So. Uh, Connor, go ahead. I, I just say, I, I think it was a good idea back then. I think it's still a good idea. You know, we're skint, but there's like that expression, define or be defined. I'd rather uh, define what that spot looks like right in our downtown than let somebody else do it. Um, so I think we gotta we gotta suck it up and, and do it. <laughs> Other comments? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I just want one question. I think last time we talked about this and I'm just not recalling. Um, do we have a valuation for this lot? Um, so we did um, the and it was well in excess of, of this amount. So so one of the things that's unusual is that so the state's actually being very like I said they've been great. They we purchased the the TKS lot for one sixty something. Um, I'd have to go do the math, but to the point of which the one thirty four was the federal share. So whatever the difference was, our share and. Um, we have since uh, taken that lot and combined it. Like I said, it's not the same lot that it was that we purchased. Okay. So at one point we looked at that lot, it would have an encumbrance of a road across it. Um, so, but it also could potentially come with parking on the other side of the road. And I believe that the price that we had come up with for Moat to buy it at, which also had to be at fair market value, it was like three thirty four or something in that range. Um, so I mean, I, I think it's a you know it's a good risk. It, I mean, selling it would mean obviously we'd be giving up 
the, the property right on um, Main Street and it would, mm, the chances are high that someone buying it would want to buy the parking with it. Uh, right. Although perhaps we could sell them without the parking with some sort of longer term parking arrangement. And if the garage were going to come in, maybe that's close enough that they would just move right over the bridge, the parking garage. So, you know, we, we'd have to see. Um, but I think just as a, as a financial move, it makes sense. Uh, and for controlling our own destiny, it makes sense. So. No, I, I, I share those thoughts. I mean, my, my concern and the question is, is that um, it's always good to control your own destiny, but at what price? Um, but what this says to me is that the, even if we weren't all that concerned about the destiny, if it was, um, you know, a, a less um, prominent lot, um, this is still a good investment for the city to make. Um, and given all these other factors, it, it, it really makes sense. I mean, it's almost foolish not to, not to invest in that, not to be able to control that lot and how it's developed. And purchasing it, as I understand it, doesn't limit any of those resources. So if, for example, tomorrow uh, or, you know, and after we purchase this, a developer comes in and says, I've got this great idea for a lot and we, you know, a building there and we, we agree as a city, then we have that option to do that. Um, because I know the MOAT proposal was a good proposal. It just wasn't necessarily one that was going to work, but it wasn't a perfect proposal. There were certainly issues with it that were still needing to be worked out. I remember I'm reviewing it on the DRV. Um, so this is this is really important. Um, and given its prominent place in the entrance to our downtown, um, you know, this seems like a no-brainer in so, some ways. So, and it, and it was identified, I think, in the downtown master plan as um, you know a good location for commercial development. It wasn't necessarily flagged as open space, but that's still right. a decision. We can make in the future. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Oh, I'd like to make a motion, and I know sometimes you'd like everyone to talk first, but they can talk after me. Uh, <laughs> so I'd like to make the motion to authorize the city manager to finalize and execute the 12 Main Street former TKS Moat property, a reimbursement with the state of Vermont Agency of Transportation as per the terms described below. Second. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Uh, I agree with what's been said. I think that uh, the we've seen a proposal that uh, that looked pretty good. I'm not sold on the idea that it has to be open space. I think that uh, you know there's not that many opportunities to get public control of a site like this right in the center of town and to have uh, <clears throat> great a great uh, degree of control over what happens to it and so I think it is a great opportunity for the city um, a question I have about the uh, about the money you know I, I appreciate that uh, that you're thinking that uh, we can uh, come up with the $67,000 between now and the end of June, is this the kind of purchase where if we conclude we do not have the cash on hand that we can take out a mortgage to, uh, <laughs> to do that? Um, so normally, yes. Um, if the if the landowner was willing to um, basically like take back the mortgage themselves and, and have the land be the, the collateral, is it, in other words, we can't borrow against the full faith and credit of the city unless we have a vote of the public. Okay. But if it was a, a you know, if it was secured by the, the real estate, um, it's possible that we could do that. I mean, I think we would be paying off the second half of it next year anyway, uh, presumably, if it stays in the budget. And we think we think we can do it, but um, this year. But you know, so we we could look at financing it, but I think it's cleaner for us. The sooner we can get it done, the better. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I'm just thinking, is that an alternative if 
yeah. you're faced with the necessity. Thank you. Maybe. I mean, I'd want to want to work that one through with an attorney more closely. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Any further discussion? Uh, may, Madam Mayor, may I have a question? Go for it. Uh, the when will the actual uh, ability to change potentially change the lot lines take effect? Will that be? 2022 after the second payment is made to the state because that problem we, we created a problem of truck access to that rear lot and I know that our public works director has you know prior to COVID been trying to help resolve it but the problem is that the, the way that lot is configured and that parking lot granite curb the trucks cannot get in through there uh, they could go in through that way and exit through the uh, alley by Jacob's property, but we still have this problem of semis parking in the travel lanes of Main Street that needs to be resolved, and this is an opportunity to resolve it if we have control and the discussion to change the lot lines and or uh, designate some of that rear uh, parking cur uh, radius to uh, essential uh, commercial truck traffic. So I just ask is that we that we try to be aware that that needs to be done whenever we have the, the control over that property to do so. Thanks. So yeah. the, good. Those aren't really related issues um, because the city technically owned all three properties when the access was designed and built because it was built for transportation purposes, um, but it was designed with the idea that a that a building could go in in the front part and parking in the back. So design construction of that access isn't related. I mean, the, the property line with the neighboring property isn't gonna change, the, the Jacobs property beyond. So, um, so they're, they're kind of two separate issues. Good to know though, so thank you. Um, any further comments? Okay, there's uh, been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right, so we are moving on. Um, I just want to recognize that it is approaching nine o'clock and we have two uh, important items yet to go. Um, so hoping that we can um, uh, well, the conversation will, will do what it needs to do, um, but I'm guessing we may not be done by 10 um, tonight. Uh, Donna, go ahead. We actually have three. Remember the COVA update that we oh, bypassed? Thank you. That's right. That's right. Well, that's still at the end, so we got, we've got three. Um, all right, 10 o'clock may not be realistic, but I uh, just wanted to remind us of that. Uh, so uh, uh, towards the... Um, the item of the Gurdon Pocket Park. So um, I would love to start this conversation uh, by uh, inviting, if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on it, um, we'll start there and, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion about what to do. Um, so any members of the public who would like to comment. This is, this is Zach Hughes, how do you hear me? We can hear you, Zach. Zach, would you like to go first? Yes, I would. Um, I'm just going to try to be in that two minute uh, area for you, uh, Madam Mayor. And uh, 10 o'clock doesn't sound realistic, but that was uh, happy thinking, I think. Um, yeah. So, uh, good evening. I um, just want to be very brief. It's been kind of an emotional day for me today on different fronts, but um, I do want to say that. Uh, this issue is uh, about more than, uh, for some of us, is about more than the park. And I um, do recognize everyone's um, arguments on it. And um, no, I, I do want to um, start by something my dad said. Um, it, and, um, I, and I have to say, I do like the new signs downtown, um, but he did mention to me to be fair, with Thanksgiving as we're driving through, 
he said, Is, wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, do something for the less fortunate? Does that see any signs? And so I kind of just nodded that off. And uh, I do like the signs, but uh, it was something interesting. Um, yesterday, I took a little field trip on the bike path. I normally take Memorial Drive as a shortcut uh, over to the state street side. And, uh, you know, on my way over there, I noticed, and I'm sure it's because winter's coming and all that, but I noticed the picnic tables were, were gone or stored. Um, and then I got over to Gershwin, and the gentleman I was supposed to meet to do a banking transaction um, that I do every week with him uh, for my services, um, he, he met me over there, and he um, just wanted to go do his banking transaction, but I said I wanted to look around the park for a minute. And, um, and then I talked to him because he, he was hanging out in that park. And uh, he's on the verge of homelessness, and he uh, likes to hang out over there. So he, I asked him about it. He said, well, he was bothered by the fact that the place was always trashed. And he tried to talk to the other people. He always tries to tell them they need to keep it clean because he's afraid they'll re that you guys will relocate it. And, and um, so I, um, cause I asked him about his impressions of the park and he just, um, his take of it was, it'd be nice if it could be cleaner, if there could be larger garbage cans over there perhaps, but that that should not be taken away from, you know, that situation. So I thought that was useful. Um, and to me, it's just a very, um, I don't even know why it's emotional for me. I mean, it's a park. Um, I, but I do think that I just want to point out that it's more than just the park. It's really about, are we continuing to do enough? And we are doing the best we can. I get that. Um, but I just want to keep that in mind. I'll keep my statement at that point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. All right, others. Uh, Paige, yes, go ahead. Paige, you are muted. No, I'm not. Well, now we can hear you now. Okay, you must have unmuted me. Sorry. Okay, um, I'm not sure where to start. I've, I've talked with uh, a number of you. We met in the pouring rain the other night at the park and talked about it. Um, I was not a fan of moving it, um, more because I feel that the people who are using it need to use it than, um, and also I, I feel that it truly beautified a pretty ugly spot along the bike path. Um, but I do think I, I do see that it's not necessarily serving the purpose that it was supposed to serve. I, so I could, I could see moving it if it were moved to a good location. Um, probably not right away, because I think that something needs to take its place as a shelter for the people who need shelter before it goes anywhere. Um, I think that's really important. We can't be heartless about this. Um, the flip side of that is that I've been out there a couple of times when the odor was just so bad you couldn't really go near it. And that was really disturbing. Um, and it's, it, it is a mess. It's in a very difficult place to keep clean. And I, Alex guys have been out there a couple of times a week, but you need water. It needs to be hosed down a lot and it's a hard place to keep clean. So. That's my two cents. I think we need to provide something for people before we move it. Thank you. Um, also, I, I see, uh, Ken, you've turned your video on. Um, and Morgan, would either of you like to, to speak? I'll let Ken go first. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it ser clearly serves an unmet need for the homeless population and we certainly need structures like this um, um, we've we've explored doing something similar behind another way and are open if you ever wanted to move the parklet there that could work um, I understand there may be some complications being because it's a private business over there 
but it was certainly um, my dream would be to you know, I had Ward Joyce out there, the architect of the park, come out and look, can you build another one here? And Steve Rivellini's open to having something on his land there, which is where our garden is. We've talked about it at the countywide level. It'd be great to have, I mean, this sort of fits in the continuum of care. There's a certain segment of the population, the homeless population, who just doesn't cut it in the motels, doesn't cut it in, in the shelters. Um, folks, you know, there have to be rules in these places. And there's folks who just don't like to be indoors. So there is a need for sort of a durable shelter. And so it's good from my perspective that the community's focused on this population and their needs. Um, it's tough with winter coming on, you know, this, the ground is freezing up, but certainly I, I, it does seem like, more, and one more thing is, is people need a place to go gather. It's a public gathering place, whether, and these are members of the public, um, it sort of sort of suggests there needs to be there are more more of these type places. There's a there's a demand for it. Um, it's the the mess and the odor and the me it's it's difficult. And I've been out with crews trying to Christmas Day last year cleaning the park and just like cleaning the teenagers' room, you know, and tried to help encourage folks to keep things clean. Um, but I understand why this is a difficult issue. I understand why it's difficult to come around that corner off the bike bridge. And, and that that's, feels very cornering and intimidating. So um, anyway, those are, those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Um, Peter, I see you're, you're here. I, I'm just guessing, but did you want to weigh in, Peter? Oh, that's OK. Oh, you're muted, though. Did you mean Peter Kalman? I did mean you, yes. Oh. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, the only thing I, I would like to add is that I just hope we will be very careful, very clear that our objections are not to the people who use it, no matter how much it might smell or be unruly that this is not an anti-homeless um, sentiment being um, heard. I have heard anti-homeless sentiment by people discussing this uh, uh, park. And I just hope, and I trust that the city council will not um, be swayed by that kind of uh, attitude. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, just uh guessing here but Stephen, what did you want to weigh in at all and also morgan's back oh and morgan thank you actually i've lost morgan morgan did you want to weigh in at all uh yes i did okay please go ahead uh sorry i um something happened i had to call back in No worries. Now is a now's a good time. Okay, so Morgan Brown, uh, District Three. Um, all right. So some people have kind of already covered some of the ground I was going to cover. So anyway, I hadn't uh, known where Girton Park was, and I had to find it, and then I was able to come across it, and then. Uh, Oh, within the last week or so, uh, Dan can correct me if I'm wrong, but he reached out with me uh, to me and uh, he had some discussion points and he wanted to talk. And so we turned it into a, a walking discussion and we made it over to Girton Park and stuff. And, uh, we spoke for almost four and a half hours, you know, uh, discussed a lot of different things, but the conversation kept going back to Girton Park and, you know, that's, I understand uh, Dan's and Jay's and other people's uh, concerns, I do. Um, what I kept stressing was, um, you know, what people are concerned about are symptoms, you know, and we need to address what the real um 
root unmet needs and circumstances are. And if we just, you know, go move in the pocket, doesn't other people point it out, including today at the task force meeting, you know, that some people could, you know, still camp out there. You know, you're not going to, you're just moving the problem and maybe not because some people could, you know, there's a spot there. They they could put their tents up there. There's nothing stopping them. Or, or you know, uh, you know, poncho or whatever. And what, what myself and many others have, you know, have tried to suggest is let's try to address the real unmet need that's there, that this is a symptom of, you know, and maybe, you know, that will be beneficial certainly for those people and, and the community at large, you know, uh, um, if it wasn't for what people did with me, working with me and stuff, I'd still be out there. You know, I was out there for 12 years, you know, and I tell you, it's real hard. Uh, nobody gets to where they are, whether for better or worse on their own. And certainly, uh, if people are in, you know, stuck in, in dire straits, you know, it's hard to move on like, on your own. And, and we all need, you know, other people uh, sometimes to be involved as long as we're comfortable with that. And that's why the, the, oh, oh, you know, having a peer worker could be very, very beneficial because that person, you know, is going out and has relationships with people. And I tell you, that's a key ingredient to helping a person get housed and maintain housing is the, those type of relationships. I know, because that's why I'm housed right now. I've been housed for, you know, about 11 years. And before that, it was 12 years out there, the last go around. And if we want to make a difference, we got to, and we can, we can do it, okay? It is possible to do, but we have to find a well and make it a high priority and realize that Montpelier does have a role to play. We have a role to play and we need to do better and more. And we can, we can make the difference. So I'd rather us be talking about that kind of stuff rather than apocalypse structure. Okay, the, the pocket structure is a symptom, you know, it's a symptom, you know, and the thing is, as Ken said, the people we're talking about, they're members of the public too, you know? And anyway, I think I've said my piece, but if you got questions, feel free to field them. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Morgan. Um, Paige, something to add. Yeah. Uh, Steve Whitaker, I I mentioned uh, at a Sorry. class at the last. Can oh. you hear me? Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I mentioned at the last meeting that that this is a uh, multifaceted, very complex problem, and the if we do it right, we will. Uh, accomplish a lot of uh, necessary uh, introspection and uh, we'll be changing the rudder of how we deal with the less fortunate in our community. So this is a uh, an issue, I think it, I'm pretty sure it was Justice Brandeis that uh, popularized the concept of proportional impact, an assessment of the proportional impact. You know, it's, it's easy to say it's an inconvenient, it's a tight corner, the bicyclist or somebody didn't want to smell the body odor, you know, or we can't, conversely, we can't get our public works department to go out there and power wash the thing every two weeks, you know, but the impact on the folks that utilize that uh, is much greater and needs to be respected here, that, that we should 
leave the status quo in place while we make sure a real plan is done, be it done by the homelessness task force or you pay a contractor. I, uh, I know that a plan would include a number of such structures where people who can hang out, have a little privacy, maintenance is maybe, uh, you, we, you need to arrange for access to the transit center bathrooms for people who use that so that they won't have to uh, soil the place or climb over the bridge and, you know, uh, crap on the riverbank. Um, my point is that to make this decision absent a framework of alternatives uh, that uh, offer, you know, compassionate respect to those folks that um, aren't heard as well in the community and who aren't uh, valued as well in the community uh, needs to be guiding this decision. Uh, this, this should not be something that we're doing a knee jerk, especially when you recognize that the charge you gave the task force has not been completed. And you might want to add to that charge uh, and, you know, revise the composition of that task force in order to get the job done. But it needs to address restrooms and lockers and, and day hangout spaces and, and bathroom facilities and, and, and dignified camping. I mean, you're, you're going to have people who are going to use these facilities. And there should even be showers. We want to be welcoming, you know, uh, long trail people to come into town. Not everybody can afford hotel rooms. So I'm just asking that we do this right and we do it with a long range vision that this is part of our um, awakening as a community to uh, the, the small things we can do to reintegrate, incorporate, respect, and dignify those in our community who are less fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. And Paige, go ahead. Sorry, I wasn't unmuted before. Um, I want to thank Morgan for reminding me that when we had that conversation um, at the park the other night, Connor suggested that we get the peer advocate um, that works for the task force um, and ask that person to talk to the people out there and see what it is they do need. And I thought that was an excellent suggestion and hope that's going to get followed up on. Um, because I agree, I, we need to provide something. And, um, and I think that this little shelter should stay where it is until something is, something else is provided. Um, okay. So thank you. Um, is there anyone, anyone else from the public who would like to comment on this? Can I, can I just uh, respond to Paige's comment, which I appreciate. Um, yes. So Don Little, who right now works for Good Samaritan, um, and did apply is, you know, is the peer worker, um, does talk to those folks and does ask what they need and provides a lot of what they need, like the short term, um, you know, but those dialogue, that, that dialogue happens quite a bit. Um, folks want housing that's suitable. Um, folks have a lot of, you know, immediate needs. Um, and, and there are some folks that are just out there partying. So, you know, but that's maybe a surface behavior and they're, they're, they have deeper needs. And, and, but just, just, I wanted to reassure you that those one-on-one -on -one contacts with folks ha happen quite a bit. So, but it's a, it's a good thought. So um, I just want to uh, start here by saying that I, I you know, appreciate all of the thoughts that you all have shared. And it, does, it feels like there is a, uh, a need to go, uh, to go deeper on the issue of homelessness, to um, sort of bring that back to the front and maybe maybe this means um re just touching base with the homelessness task force um you know 
it's been a, a little while since uh, since we, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I know we got a report from you all on, on uh, well, it's sort of a report, I suppose, or an update anyway on this particular topic. But uh, it, it could be great to hear um, either what you all are up to or what you need or what um, sort of what is on the edge um, of your work. Um, and uh, so I, I'm also, so I'm hearing, I just want to reflect that I am hearing a lot of um, a need to address the deeper issues. Um, also hearing that, um, and I think Morgan sort of said, said this um, somewhat, but that, uh, you know, it's, it does feel like, you know, that in a sense, that's more worth talking about than just the structure, um, but that these two things don't have to, um, like if we, can, if we can go deep on the issue of homelessness um, and we can provide uh, for needs or whatever um, functions that structure is providing, um, that that might create a window for um, relocating it for other reasons that, that have also been identified as why it's problematic there. Um, so in any case, I just wanted to, to open with that thought and um, see what, who uh, what else has thoughts or comments. Um, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is an issue that I've been struggling with probably more than a lot of the things we address here on the council. And it's really helped me to crystallize my thinking about homelessness in general and the city's role in addressing it. And I'm not going to get into that too much tonight. <clears throat> I feel I need to start by saying that I don't think that anybody on the council is motivated by any invidious responses to the people uh, who use this place or who uh, or any anything other than a sincere desire to serve the best interests of, of the city of Montpelier. I, I truly believe that with regard to all of us on the council. Um, as I've been thinking about what do we do, one of the things that has uh, been in my mind has been uh, the uh, one of the things that's a watchword of the uh, disability rights movement, which is nothing about us without us. And I'm not a person in the, I'm not a disabled, disabled person, but I certainly work with people who are diagnosed as having disabilities every day. And uh, I realized I hadn't been out there to talk to the people at the park. And so I did go out there and, uh, and talk to some folks there yesterday. And uh, although they, there were people who didn't initially want to talk to me, um, I'm, I'm kind of used to that anyway. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so I had what I thought was a good conversation. Yeah, I agree with Zach that uh, this is more about more than the park. Um, it's about what we're saying to to the people, what the city of Vermont is saying to the people and who we value and how we value them. Um, the, this park and this parklet and the other parklets in the city all are uh, characterized in uh, urban planning uh, or urban studies literature as a third place. You know, you have your home, you have your work, and you have a third place where you go out and you congregate with other people and uh, and it provides a real value to have that kind of place um, when i was growing up one of my brothers <clears throat> had a friend who lived all the way on the other side of town it was only a 12 000 person town but they figured out what was the midpoint and so they would go and get together and hang out on this guy's front yard uh, halfway between our house and their house. And, and they, that's just where they would hang out and talk. And when one of my sons and a bunch of his friends were in high school, 
they had one summer where they would uh, go over and, uh, <clears throat> you know, that uh, railroad car behind the, uh, the feed store. Every day they would go over and climb up and hang out on top of the railroad car and, <laughs> and just hang out and, and talk to each other. And they had friends, my, I had, my son had a cousin from out of town who came to visit and he thought it was the coolest thing that they could just do that. And nobody, uh, nobody raised uh, the slightest objection to them doing that. Um, so I talked to the folks at uh, Girton Park and uh, I said, well, what's going on here? And maybe more importantly, where would you be if this wasn't here, if this structure wasn't here? And they said, well, they need it because they need someplace to be out of the elements. And if the structure were moved, I was talking to Paige uh, by email the other day and it's not clear to me whether we consider Girton Park to be that structure alone or that structure in that location. What is it that defines that as Girton Park? Um, but what they said told me was that uh, if that structure were moved, they would probably still be there because they need to have some place to be. And so does that mean we would just have people sitting hanging out on the ground, bringing folding chairs or whatever, possibly, possibly it would. And, you know, if, if the city wanted to make things hard for people, we could decide, okay, we're, even after we move the structure, we're not going to plow that section of it so that uh, they just have these have to be sitting in the snow. I don't think we want to be, be like that. I don't think we want to be the city that does that kind of thing. Um, what they did say was that uh, one of the guys I talked to said was that he was really unhappy about how messy the place gets and now they have a garbage can and a recycling can there and that that has helped and they thought it would really be helpful if there were also one of those uh, ashtrays, one of those uh, but whatever they call them that uh, <clears throat> that the smoking group uh, puts oh, around the city. And uh, that would provide an opportunity to not throw their cigarette but butts on the ground. Um, I observed that uh, it would be good if, uh, you know, there's, there's AC right there. I think it would be good if uh, there could be an AC outlet that uh, they could use for uh, for charging their phones while they're there. Um, and I assume that that uh, AC is because it's a because it's a like a street light or equivalent to a street light. So it's probably paid for by on the uh, Green Mountain Power uh, street light rate. But uh, I don't think it would be that difficult to also create uh, a charging opportunity for the folks there. And, uh, and then the other thing I thought of just this afternoon is uh, maybe we could provide an opportunity for the people who spend time there, or some of the people who spend time there to uh, have some responsibility for keeping the place clean. I, I know that Washington County Mental Health has, uh, has some occupational, has an occupational program as part of the services they do. Maybe we could bring Washington County Mental Health into the conversation. And I know not everybody likes to be involved with the, with the establishment mental health agencies, but that might be an opportunity to uh, give the uh, the users of that park some uh, stake in in the maintenance of the place that uh, would be uh, that would improve the park and make it better for uh, for the whole city. And so, 
those are that's a lot of thoughts that all come down to me thinking that uh, I uh, do not think that we should uh, we should be moving it at this point, and I would not be supportive of uh, of moving it. And I think that there are are things that we can do to improve the situation. Okay, thank you. Other thoughts, uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, I agree. I've all along not thought the movement was the solution to whatever you wanted to find the problem here of shared spaces. But I do think deeping diver into the whole issue of what anyone who's homeless faces. And I think of all the comments Stephen has made about running water. And I got a conversation with Stephen Rubabellini, who Kev, uh, Kevin Russ, Ken Russell put me on to because he was talking with another way about putting a shelter behind them, uh, like a 10 by 10 that Ward Joyce was gonna work on. But Steve mentioned mobile classrooms that come with bathrooms and you could put a shower in there. You could like maybe put it behind the rec building so you could connect electricity, maybe plug in running water that we really look a little more broadly and try to bring in a lot of regional organizations. I left a message with Capstone but didn't get to talk to Susan. But I think that we need to look at that really, really broadly. And even Stephen Rubellini mentioned Berry Street Rec as maybe that's a place we could use while it's under limited use by recreation people and see if there's a way to take advantage of the showers there with some regulated opportunities to get clean. I, I just think we have some resources we're not using right now. And just between now and March would make a huge impact while we look at something that's more substantial by the other players that have deeper pockets than us <laughs> and have the staff and the expertise. But I think it's good if we could be a catalyst, maybe kick that kind of thinking off. Uh, so that's where I would like to put our time is looking forward to what we can create instead of still mauling over this structure that I actually like where it's at. I like it slows down the bicycles at the corner as a pedestrian. I, I don't have so many surprises. Um, I just, yeah, I really think we should deal on the big issue, the big picture of what we need to do to help those that are homeless. So I just want to reiterate, I think we can, we can do that, um, you know, uh, take a hard look at what needs to be done, um, but also acknowledge that there are issues with, with it where it is. Um, but in any case, uh, other thoughts? Uh, Connor, go ahead. I think it's a good conversation um, because it does uh, generate discussion about the deeper issues. Uh, it's a chat that we might not be having now, if not for this park. It's a, at the same time kind of a bad discussion because it becomes like a symbol, right? And it's dictated like whatever you decide might dictate what direction the city's going and it becomes like a microcosm of the bigger issues there. Um, and I, I'll agree with Jack, I don't think anybody's coming in here. This is a council that voted against a smoking ban downtown. We didn't entertain any ordinances to ban like loitering in town or something. Um, you know, I'm not approving like a park like this so people can like sip lattes like. Um, I, I think anybody who wants to hang on there. When we talk about the sense of community, um, it's some of the folks who are there now, uh, but it's to have it accessible to as many people as possible. So yeah, we had a good discussion, I think, <laughs> at the rain for like about an hour the other day. Um, and uh, over the course of that, I was convinced that maybe it wasn't the best place, right? I was convinced that it might not be the best place because it's congested. Um, you know, it's like riddled with urine, it's trashed a lot of the time. And like Ward Joyce was saying, a lot of people in town just don't know it exists where it is, frankly. Um, you know, if you look at, and you know, I'll bring it up, it's, it is a memorial. When you make something a memorial, um, I think you do have an obligation um, to listen, to like page there who's saying, you know, it would be nice if it was on the water. It would be nice if it was central enough in town. Like don't exile it out somewhere else. So I, I, th I think there are some alternatives that it could still be on the bike path maybe. Um, who knows about 12 Main Street facing the water or something. It could still be accessible to people that might just be a different location. Um, but when we build something because it like fits a need, you know, 
I, I think if I was envisioning this fitting the need for this particular group of folks who's um, staying there, I, I would envision something that like has four walls, that has like water, that has this kind of stuff, and not just something that covers them from being like stuck in the rain. So um, I, I think that's like, it's awesome to hear like dawns on the ground, like talking to people. I think that's exactly what we mean. Like when we like funded a, a social worker position and a homeless liaison position, I think the next like few months can be an opportunity to treat this sort of as a test case to say, um, and I, I've been down there like Jack, I've spoken to people. It's not too many people. Um, can we really just do a full court press with this group of people and see what needs they have and bring that up to the council just as sort of a case study to see what we need to be doing for them, which radiates out to other people in the community to help them. Um, but I, I don't think this needs to be a purist discussion. I think it has the ability to turn into that. Um, I, I think we need to do what's right for the structure, what's right for everybody else. Um, I think we can make a determination that this might not be the best place, uh, but continue the discussion going forward here. So um, I'd be okay moving the thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. We need to get to the heart of the deeper issues here. Other thoughts, Dan? So um, I've also spent that hour in the rain uh, with, with everyone. And I spent uh, a substantial amount of time last week with Morgan talking through some of these issues, in, in part because um, when I initially approached this issue, and I should say I, I didn't approach it, it more or less approached me. I had constituents um, contacting me with complaints. And, you know, one of our jobs as city councilors is to articulate when a constituent says, I'm bothered by this, and these are the issues, um, you, you have a job as a city councilor to bring those issues forward. Um, and I left our last iteration of this discussion, which was really more of a meta discussion about whether we were gonna have a discussion, wondering why this was such a difficult issue and uh, listening and hearing people's emotionally charged responses to these issues. Um, and I think it's been articulated tonight, so I won't say too much more, but we, we've, we've layered on to this or intertwined with this, these bigger issues of homelessness. And so let me say I, I support, you know, what the mayor is proposing and what I think Ken is willing to do, which is let's, let's have a discussion with the homelessness task force about some of these issues and about their charge and about, um, you know, the work that they're doing and the work that can be done um, and the needs and understanding the needs. And that's, that's really, you know, when I say I had a conversation with Morgan, um, it, I did less of the talking and I'm glad about that um, to hear some of the issues. Um, but I think it is important that we have this conversation. You know, there's a report out this week from the National Low Income Housing Coalition that says in the coming six months, nationally, there's gonna be about 6.7 million evictions because they've all been stored up and saved and there's been a moratorium that's gonna be lifted. And when that 6.7 evictions start to move, we're talking about 19 million people nationwide that could be losing their homes um, or their st stable housing. Um, and how many of those are gonna be in Vermont? How many of those are gonna be in Montpelier? I don't know. What are their needs gonna be? How is that going to affect that? We don't know. But I think we have an opportunity here to talk about those deeper issues and to address those. And um, I think using the, the parklet may have been the catalyst for this conversation. Um, but I, I think keeping the two topics together has a potential for a toxic result. Um, and that really what we need to do is focus on these homelessness issues um, as they are, as everybody wants to, um, as, you know, address them full on. Don't use proxies of a, a parklet or um, other things. Let's see what we can understand and what our role can be as a, as a municipality 
fitting within a larger series of municipalities in a region. So I, I fully agree and support with that. Um, and I think, you know, what, what I'm taking away from what I'm hearing from people is that moving the parklet right now is, is fraught with um, issues, not the least of which is that we really haven't identified its, its role within this series of problems. We know that there's a use that's being made of it, but we don't know how many people are using it. We don't know what the alternatives are um, or what the alternatives could be. Uh, so, you know, I agree, given that we have these, uh, you know, we have these needs in our community, um, we can certainly listen to them. Um, but at the same time, I, I never saw this issue initially as a homelessness issue. This was an issue that the parklet for a number of reasons just isn't a good fit in its present location. That if we address the homelessness issues, it, it doesn't address the fact that it, I don't think it serves, when we talked with Ward, you know, he agreed. It really wasn't serving the initial purpose that it was intended for, which was, you know, a shelter, um, a momentary shelter on the bike path. Um, it was really intended to be a way station um, and it's not really serving that because in some ways it's too close to the city for people using the bike path and too far from the takeout places to be sort of that community gathering spot that, for example, the parklet outside of uh, Charlio's used to serve or the parklet outside of uh, the Episcopal Church serves. Um, and so, you know, again, you know, with the concerns about distancing in a, in a COVID era, I think that this parklet, you know, is not um, the right spot there because people who feel uncomfortable or feel crowded don't have the opportunity to move apart. And I'm not talking about feeling intimidated by people living, uh, not living, sorry, <laughs> sitting there, or it's just, it's a crowded and a bottleneck. Um, and I think those, those concerns continue. Um, and, you know, there has been, there has been misuse of that. And we've all discussed these issues, trash, um, alcohol, drugs, um, you know, uh, urination. We've had reports of nudity um, and other activities there. Um, and I don't know who's doing that um, or what populations are doing that, but those are issues that obviously give people concern. Um, and, you know, it, those issues may go away, but they may not. And to the extent that they don't, I think it's still, you know, it adds to that list. Um, and I think when we, when we think about this, we have to think about, you know, uh, we have to def separate out these issues. So let's, let's talk about homelessness. Let's talk about those needs um, in our community and whether this is the best place for them or whether there are alternatives and not just this need, but other needs as well. Let's have that broader discussion. Um, you know, let's get, let's talk about the gaps in the social services that are being delivered now. Um, and then let's talk about the parklet itself a, as a separate topic. Um, but I think it's a predicate rather than uh, a beginning. And I think we, we talk about the parklet and we talk about where the parklet goes or whether it stays. Um, as a separate conversation. Um, but I think we, we talk about the these issues first because they're they're not tied to the parklet, but they're certainly symbolized by this discussion of the parklet. And the more we can decouple those, I think the more we can have the conversations that everyone in this situation really wants to have. Thank you. Uh, Jay or Lauren? Uh, Lauren, go ahead, and then Jay. Lots of <laughs> lots of good discussion and good food for thought. Um, I mean, I think I I'm pretty much in line with uh, what I was hearing from Connor in terms of, you know, I I do think that this the structure is serving a function for um, a variety of people. Um, 
including, you know, people who are currently living unhoused. So if we're going to look to move it, I would want to, um, you know, consider a location that allows people to continue using it. So I, I do think there's kind of, it's, it's not an entirely black and white issue that just because you move it, you've taken that function away. And so I think we could, you know, disentangle that a little bit. Um, you know, I want to be really sensitive to Paige's uh, desires around this um, as well. Um, and, you know, keeping it on the water. Um, I know she expressed a preference tonight for leaving it where it is, um, which, you know, I, I, am, I would be fine with leaving where it is now um, unless we found a place that, you know, in my mind, what I'm hearing tonight um, and I've heard the last few meetings is, you know, somewhere on the water to fulfill the memorial, memorial function um, for Jed, which is really important and that would um, continue to allow it to um, kind of function the way it is right now, but maybe there's a space that's less congested. Um, and so I think that could be a potential um, solution that I would be comfortable with. Um, I also, you know, welcome and I'm eager to have broader conversations about um, what the city is doing around homelessness. I'm concerned about what could happen with federal dollars running out and you know what what's going to be happening to people um, if there are not the same um, kind of supports that the state was putting in place um, you know come January or whenever that might happen um, so I think we need to really be watching it closely and when we look at our our city budget and you know think about what we're funding or not that we're being really thoughtful of you know uh, what, what the impacts of cutting or maintaining uh, budgeting for, for different, um, different programs and different uh, supports for the city. So um, I guess that's where my head is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Um, well, I certainly appreciate everybody's thoughts on this. I know everybody's <clears throat> has given it a lot of time and consideration and I'm appreciative of that. I'm not going to echo um, what everybody has said, but I, I guess what I sort of pose to the group is what are our tangible next steps? If we are, um, how do we apply some accountability to this process? How do we, you know, consider, you know, e even beyond um, relocating the, the, the pocket park, how are we going to, you know, who's going to take some proactive steps to manage, to make sure that um, the populations that that's using it in this way, if we are looking at it as really as two separate, separate questions as a, as an issue of homelessness, as well as really a, a, just a logistical and feasible location for the pocket park. If we're going to um, try to work with the population that's there, who, who do we look to, to make some decisions and be proactive on, um, on supporting that population. And so I, you know, I look to, to, to Ken or, or really anybody, is, is, is it the um, homelessness task force um, or, or is it city staff? Like where, 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 uh, where, where do we, where do we take some next steps to try to, it sounds like we're, we're not going to, you know, go tomorrow morning, the city staff isn't going to go pick it up and move it somewhere. So beyond that, because there are some more, obviously more significant macro issues at play here, how can we look to start resolving them? So, because I think there's been a lot of really good thought and conversation uh, around the issues at play, um, but I, I just would love to, you know, hear ideas on what next steps might be. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure, I, I was just gonna offer maybe some suggestions because uh, I have thought about that. And I think Jay's question's a really good one. Um, and I would suggest maybe two tracks. Um, one track would be asking Ken when he'd be available to come to the city council with the homelessness task force or, or you know, their representatives to, to start this process. Uh, understanding that probably January is budget time um, and working with our our schedule sort of as the um, docket fills up as it were 
um, but looking to sort of start that process of let's let's get reports from the homelessness task force and let's start that conversation and maybe the second um and i'm always reluctant to do this but you know maybe this is a the look if we talk about the pocket park itself apart from these issues maybe it's a subcommittee that says what are the alternative sites um what are the um what are the options um and i could see that having some of us and maybe you know someone like Paige uh, on there given her stakeholder role in in this um as a way of because it it one of the things that that uh you know in talking with and looking at some of the sites that are available um just looking at the memo the city presented a number of them have flood hazard issues or um, you know further technical complications so e even if we as a city council all of a sudden said well you know we can put we can put this issue aside but let's move the pocket park a number of the locations that we've talked about come with technical issues that we couldn't answer tonight um, and so it may make sense to have a smaller group take a look at the options including the option of keeping it there um and maybe making modifications you know pushing the the wooden bench that's really close to the bridge further back um or you know uh saying you know addressing some of the concerns that i, I i've heard as well uh about that i articulated about where it's located and what does it serve the bike path function that it's intended to serve um but have those two tracks sort of move independently with an idea that you know come march we would have both of those conversations going in a robust manner. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, Paige, go ahead. Um, just briefly, I would be happy to serve on a subcommittee like that if, if um, that would be helpful. Um, and the, secondly, though, just in response to Lauren's comment, if, if I were going to provide a shelter for people who need shelter it would not be one like that building it would be one with benches that people could lie down on i i don't think that is the ideal shelter for people um so but yeah i i would be happy to serve on either of those either either trip. okay thank you Paige. um uh, did I see a hand from Lauren and then Ken? Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead, Lauren. I was just going to briefly, I, I'm not at all suggesting, like, if we were going to, from scratch, build a shelter to, to serve certain purposes, I'm saying I, I think it's being used right now, and an, unless we're offering an alternative, I don't want to take that use away from people. But I think, you know, looking more long term, if we want to build structures or, or rethink opportunities, um, then I think that should be part of the conversation. Um, but I, I did not mean to imply that that this is, you know, was structured in a certain way or, or is an ideal structure for, for meeting um, meeting needs of people. Uh, Ken. Yeah, I mean, part of what, I, yeah, yes, uh, to, you know, are we willing to do any of the above? Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad to be here as part of this discussion um i'm there are and part of the work here is there are so many people in so many rooms talking about these issues there's a there's a lot of care and concern and brains going into these issues um and at the end of the day at the end of the day you're also dealing with some human behaviors that you know there are folks that don't want to be part of a, a system or somebody else's plan or solution it's it's not just about gaps in services there there are other things going on um, but there are gaps in services um, the and at the countywide level there's this great monday morning meeting with like sue minter and mary moulton and rick deangelis and um, will everly and it's eileen peltier and they're very concerned about what's going on in montpelier so you know, I would love to, I mean, the composition of the, the task force and what we're doing, yeah, there's, we can always do better. Um, and dynamism and knowing how to convene conversations with 
many, many people most effectively and get work done is there's, it's, it's sometimes more of an art than a science. And, you know, and it's really powerful to listen to each and every person here who's speaking very thoughtfully about this and about the complexities here. So um, I hear the timeline of March that, I mean, I, I want more things to happen more quickly, but things can happen in parallel. Um, and I would just, I would love to talk to any, anybody here offline or in different formats. Love to have, um, we, we haven't had a council member at our task force meeting in, in quite some time, basically since Glenn left. Thomas, I'm on, I'm on a meeting, we need to go. Sorry, um, forget. Um, so, um, no, um, forgive, so, um, sorry. Um, but I'd be really, would love to convene more meetings quickly. Steve and I, I appreciate your stalwartness on all of these issues. Um, a lot of the issues about bathrooms and laundry and, you know, all the things that have been mentioned have been things we have covered. Um, there, there's a lot of work to be done, and I'm glad that a lot of energy is here. So. You know, one of the reasons why I am open to this idea of a, a smaller group talking about it, you know, what should be done with this structure, um, is because it's not likely to, I, I, th I think probably it is late enough in the, in the season that it wouldn't necessarily be moved until the spring anyway. So we do have a little time there. Um, Connor. Yeah, no, I was just going to say I'd be happy to serve on a small subcommittee that would stand out possible locations um, as a parallel track to some of the other discussions. Um, and I, I think Paige and I even discussed that early on, earlier on, um, maybe just in a smaller group together. So I, I'd be happy to do some work on that. I would as well. Being someone who has invested a lot of time and energy in that space. Um, how, how do others feel about creating a, a smaller group or would anybody else be interested? I think Ward would probably be interested. Yeah, fair. <laughs> other, other thoughts from other counselors, Jack, Donna, Jay? Not that's okay. I, th I think it's a good idea. It's not something that I could uh, take on given what I'm already doing. Okay. Yeah, I think just if there's a small group that you know, including Paige and 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 Ward, that understand you know the spirit of what we're trying to do with the structure. Obviously, very separate from the other the other track we're talking about. That you know, just investigating other potential spots, understanding what limitations there are, whether they're in the in a flood zone, et cetera, and structures, all that. Like doing that legwork would be great and then bringing it back to to the group to, you know, bring options that what's feasible and what's not, I think makes the most sense. Fair enough. Um, and Lauren, I know your camera's off, but I have faith that you are there. Do you have any further thoughts? No, I mean, I think it sounds like a good idea. Also, don't have capacity right now to take it on and appreciate the folks who have stepped up. Okay. I don't feel like we need a motion about that. Um, but it sounds like there is a, a small group um, consisting of Connor, myself, Paige, and um, and I, I know, Dan, you suggested it, but I didn't hear you wanting to be a part of it. Just no, I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, I've opened my mouth, so I'll, I'll put my money where it is, so I don't say too much more. Okay. All right. Um, fair enough then. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll organize a we'll get together, and hopefully we'll come back with a um, recommendation. Okay. I think of oh, Donna. Yes. Well, you mentioned a group for the park, but what about the homeless tasks? Yeah, so I, 
Thank you. I had interpreted that as let's get Ken and the homelessness task force on the agenda um, for an upcoming meeting. So in my mind, that wasn't necessarily um, an additional group, um, but but a, a, just a different kind of next step, if that's okay with you. Right. I Unfortunately, I, on one of the emails we got, someone said that Connor and I were the liaison to the homeless task force, and I didn't sign up for that. I, I haven't seen I, one meeting, Donna. <laughs> no, I, I, I haven't been there either. <laughs> I, and that's because I can, I, my work schedule and all cannot cut into mornings. But I'll be glad to reach out to some of these regional groups that the Capstone and others are involved in and see if we can bring them along as well as the Homeless Task Force to talk to us. Uh, but I, I, I can't take on that particular committee representing the council. That's all. So I, I wanted to interject real quick that I, I added that into the, um, the memo that I had sent out just because that was the assignments given in March. So. Um, I think you even said at the time that that was. Um, I don't remember that. <laughs> no one was assigned. It, people said that they were. It was a volunteer. I'll drop in when I can. It was, Which it, that it, has not happened. So good. So it may have... yeah, maybe maybe that's worth revisiting too. <laughs> um, uh, Dan and then uh, uh, Jack. Yeah. Sorry, I I just I. I, I think at least uh, initially having the task force um, talk with us might be, I, I don't want to overload this first conversation, especially as we, we, we start to get um, a handle on some of these issues and I don't want it to be too, too big. Um, but I would really look to, you know, and, and, and maybe coming out of that, that there is there is sort of further further action that we need to take, but I, I think the first step is to have the task force report to us since it is our task force, um, and and maybe it starts the task force starts to look more like a, a coalition that that helps coordinate between different groups or, or provides a place where people can talk, um, or maybe we use it more like the the way the the police review um, committee is is starting to form where it does deeper dives into some of this research and understanding and need assessment and um, so that, you know, to help us define our role. I, I don't know what that necessarily looks like, but I think that's where our conversa conversation with them and with this topic begins. Great. Um, Jack. The, the other part of it is uh, that Ken mentioned uh, these meetings he has ever, or he's part of every Monday morning. And I don't know if that's the uh, uh, continuum of care, but uh, I think, okay, no. But so this is, these are a group of uh, people who are uh, more than just planners. There are people who are, whose organizations do concrete things. And I would expect Ken having heard and participated in this whole conversation, including the idea of a number of concrete uh, things that, uh, we are talking about is that I, I would expect that part of the conversation in one of these meetings coming up very soon will be what can all of the entities that uh, are represented at this, these meetings do to move forward with some of this stuff, uh, with implementing some of this stuff sooner than uh, March or, or February or January. Uh, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, these are folks that are getting stuff done now. I'm not not to not to be blunt or rude, um, but I mean that's part part of the. I mean these th this is a came out of the Winock Rock Spring COVID emergency planning structure, and these folks have been meeting every Monday since since then. Um, and so, um, you know, Eileen's, I can't even keep track of all the housing she's put online through Down Street. And there's going to be more this month. And, um, and the, there are folks in motels, the bulk of the people are in motels, there's dealing with security, you know, so forgive me, I, I just sounded really grouchy, I, but, but certainly connecting with them, responding to what Dan was saying and where the conversation starts makes good sense. 
we owe you a report. It's been a year. Um, you know, I, 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 I think we should do a written report to, for efficiency, responding to the charge, and an analysis of where we think we are. And um, certainly we'll bring this conversation to that group on Monday um, and, can, and can report back. Um, so forgive me for cutting through stuff. And, but but I, I, do, I do want to point out there, there is this dynamic in this work where they're the folks that are actually have the capacity and the organizations that are working on these issues and can get stuff done. That's what that meeting is. And then there are a lot of people wanting to solve all the world's problems and that's good and all that adds up. But, but oftentimes it's like what's actually getting done is, you know, it, there, there are a lot of people wanting to solve homelessness and then there's the whole rubber meeting the road thing and who's actually making that happen. And so that's, and, and I say that with not taking, not taking, not assuming that anybody here is, is pie in the sky. I, I, I hear a real seriousness, a desire to, to really in a concrete way, solve these problems. Uh, go ahead, Jack. And then I, I think it's probably time to move on. Um, I got a suggestion while this is, discussion was going on that it would be might be useful to invite one of the people who uh, spend time using that park to be part of the uh, committee that uh, various people have volunteered to be on and we may or may not get someone to agree to do it I, I tried to get people to log on to the meeting tonight to be heard and uh, Nobody was particularly interested in doing that, but um, that doesn't mean we don't keep uh, trying. I'll make the invite. I, I can pop over this week. Great. Thank it, you. It might just it might be good just to show up with a video camera and say, "Are you willing to talk?" You know, what? Ask them some questions. Just right in the moment. Forgive cool. me. All right, well, um, one of the things that I appreciate about this group is how thoughtful you are and how you take um, the important issues really seriously. So thank you. Um, all right, so uh, I think we're gonna move on from that conversation right now, um, unless there's any further, further last thoughts here. I think the bell tolls for moving on. I indeed, indeed it does. All right, I know it's ten, but like we're gonna we're gonna make it happen, team. Um, all right, thank you, everybody, and on to the budget. So I think I'm. Am I passing that on to who? Am I passing it on to okay. Kelly? Bill? Okay. Yeah. Um. So the good news with the budget is that we are way ahead of the schedule that we normally have um, for doing these. Um, the not so good news is we're not quite as far ahead as we thought we'd be tonight. So we do have a budget draft uh, internally. We are making some final, uh, I'll use Kelly's word, we're ticking and tying. And um, we are trying to to finalize things. So what I'm going to do is give you um, the real 20,000 foot view of where we are. A lot of this will probably be familiar. I'm going to try to stay away from some specifics because we're still have a few more decisions to make. And actually this conversation tonight um, was helpful uh, in a lot of these issues, hearing, hearing where you're at on things. Um, and also in some cases we have some communications to make with various folks to let them know where we are and have, that hasn't happened yet. So I uh, don't want them getting information this way. So uh, with that said, I'm going to attempt for the very first time ever to share my screen. Uh, I did do a practice run this afternoon with Cameron, but, um, and now it says host disables participant screen sharing. <laughs> I fixed it. I fixed it. I'm sorry. I was a little slow on the uptake. I'm, it's, you should share it now. Be able to do that. Okay. Yes. Can everybody see that? 
Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Look at that. Okay. So this is actually going to be a, um, a pretty fast uh, thing. So my goal today, let me, let me begin with the end in mind. I'm going to give you this quick overview. You will be getting the full budget books, hopefully by Friday, certainly by Monday, um, with all the detail and a lot of information in it. And then next Wednesday, uh, we would be ha having the full substantive discussion anyway. So we're not really losing time. I just had hoped to be able to be a little bit more particulars tonight. I'm just not comfortable doing that. I, we're not just, you know, it sounds kind of silly, but before I sign my name on, you know, recommending a budget to you, I want to make sure it's exactly what I want it to say. So we're, um, and I, I say that specifically because Kelly, the staff, everyone else has done their jobs. The numbers are all put together. It's me tinkering with the final product. So um, there we go. So obviously this is a preliminary budget outline and I say preliminary because subject to change. Uh, as we approached our budget, thinking about the budget, and obviously I think these are things that, themes that will uh, affect all of us this year as we continue talking. Obviously the big, the big theme is we have a major budget gap due to COVID-19. That said, we still need to deliver responsible services. We spent a lot of time developing and implement, developing a strategic plan and we should be trying to do as much of that as we can with the resources that we have. One of the key things that we dealt with as a staff, and I think the council should spend time thinking about this, is a decision about a budget horizon, a one year or a multi-year. Uh, and I think we talked about this a little earlier, and I think that the struggle we were having as a staff was the uncertainty about where we were at with COVID, and were we looking at something, this could be a two or three year thing, in which case you can't put off certain capital expenses or equipment expenses for that long a period of time, we'd have to be looking at kind of a systemic uh, reorganization of what we do. When it came time for us to do this work in the last week or two, you know, the news of the vaccine and, and these other things is out now. And so now it appears it might be a shorter horizon, particularly when you think about the fact that the budget we're talking about doesn't even start till next July 1 and goes till the following June 30 of 22. And when we're hearing news that maybe we'll all be vaccinated by June or July. So it's possible that even this budget we're talking about could be seeing a return to normalcy during its lifetime, but we just don't know that. But what we did feel comfortable with saying that is the sort of the wingspan of this from kind of now till June 30, 22. And so we, we as staff um, emphasized kind of a shorter term window and saying, okay, let's keep our services going and think what we can do to get us past the hump. Um, we have to recognize that our re res residents and businesses are hurt by COVID. So whatever decisions we make as far as spending their money is gonna affect them and, and their taxes and those kind of things. And it required us to restructure some fund transfers and most notably the, and, and that this is a little bit of inside baseball. We'll explain this in more detail when the time comes. But particularly with parking, um, you know, we, we think of our parking and we think, well, we, we pay the, the one full-time, the two part-time people, we lease some lots, you know, maybe we put some payment on, what does it cost for parking, you know, the parking meters? But actually we, a portion of our police, a portion of our dispatch, a portion of even some of our admin stuff that deal with parking have all been being paid out of the parking fund. So with the parking fund performing so badly, that puts a, a pressure on the general fund because we have to kind of reallocate those funds. And, you know, the other thing about this is, is uh, it's given us an opportunity to look at some of our long-term allocations that we've just lived with and made us think about, well, is this really right? And is this crisis an opportunity to readjust? So, um, so there was that. So just to remind you, the strategic plan, uh, Council, your, your top priorities were in alphabetical order, you know, community prosperity, COVID-19 response, environmental stewardship, more housing, responsive and responsible government and sustainable infrastructure. And you will have in your budget book, a summary um, that Cameron did a really nice job of, of taking 
the, not only these priorities, but the, the work plan that went behind it and sort of highlighting what is in and what's not in the budget. So there'll, there'll be a detailed analysis of that. So here's, let's get right to brass tacks here. We, um, our general fund is basically, we're looking at about $520,000 less in non-tax revenue um, next year than, than what we had in, what we'd have assumed for the current year budget, even though we've already downgraded that. And then the parking fund is another 525,000. And as I just mentioned, that's the impact to the general fund. That's not, um, so it's, it, you know, we can't say, well, it's a parking fund, let's cut parking expenses because it hits all sorts of, so we had a revenue gap of, of a little over a million dollars to overcome. And in addition, um, you know, budgets don't stay static. There are some things that, that tick up. And so just at the very basic, we have our personnel costs. We've got very fortunate. Some of you that sat here last year dealing with it, I remember the health insurance deal. Well, um, whatever we paid last year came through because it's only about a 4% increase this year uh, in our budget. And so that helped a lot. Um, it would have really been devastating if we'd had another massive change. Um, legal, you know, we've been woefully underfunding legal forever. And it just seems like the time, this was maybe the time to bite the bullet and get the right number in. And another, uh, I think, tactical decision that we made, um, in part because of, is talking into, we received $25,700 a year from the state for re to go towards reappraisals. Over the last several years, it's just been, that's gone as a, a or to go towards assessing our grant list, it's, it's gone into the general fund to offset our, our operating budget, which is fine. It's a perfectly legitimate use for it. But as we thought, as we realized that now we need to do a reappraisal, and so we're, you know, we've got to come up with the money over the next couple budgets. It occurs to us that, you know, in another 10 years, we're going to be in the same spot. And so, Perhaps now, as, as we're restructuring things, now is the time to start taking that 25,000 and setting it into a reappraisal reserve so that in 10 years, we'll have $257,000 uh, to help with the then council to pay for a reappraisal. So we decided that, that this was you know, something we could do so we took it out of general revenues and, and put it in reserve. So basically creating a pretty modest um, budget expense gap of just under 400,000. So making the, the loss of revenues and these built-in expenses about a $1.44 million budget gap to, to uh, create. So um, we took a look at what we did. We started with our, our human resources. We have six vacant positions currently. Uh, actually, we might have a few more, but some were filling. Uh, but we, we've chosen to leave six vacant, and we are specifically calling them leaving them vacant. We're not considering these cuts. We hope that when things restart, but for the purposes of this budget, uh, there's one police officer, patrol officer position, uh, one finance position, two in recreation uh, due to retirements. Uh, and we'll talk about that in more detail, but the plan there is that the parks department is going to assist with recreation in terms of field maintenance and this thing for this coming season. Uh, won't, won't be, that wouldn't be a forever plan, but we've worked that out for the, this year. And then DPW has a, a couple of vacancies as well. They actually have more, but they're getting filled. Uh, and some of these are were, were left over from last year. So that, uh, that brought us 384,000 in savings, a capital and equipment plan and, and our some of our folks just spent some time talking about this. Uh, it's hit pretty hard, knocked down 538,000 out of that. We've looked at some of our external and community funding, and this is one of the moving targets that we still have, but currently we've got in for about 412, a little over 413,000 operating um, budgets, of 68,000. And then we had two ballot items last year, 23.5 for CVPSA, 23.5 for Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice, and we assumed, you know, we don't normally budget for those, so, but they are in our base tax rate now, so we said they're not in. So that 
as you can see, uh, brings us to a total of 1.45 million, which is about the same as the 1.44 million gap we were trying to, trying to reconcile. So that's where you'll be looking, uh, the general areas. Um, and like I said, you'll be getting a lot of specific information about that. I guess some of the good things is we do, uh, right now this is all being done with no tax increase, uh, which uh, we staff thought was important given the hit. We did retain funding for our Montpelier Alive since they were working specifically uh, to help our downtown. The equity consultant that we had committed to remained in. Uh, MEAC had $5,000 that's still in. Um, the, even though we cut a police officer, we kept the social worker in there. Uh, the library ballot item is still in at the same amount. The personnel cost reallocations that I just talked to have now been done and are reallocated. And uh, one of our, our top priorities was um, maintaining the basic services that we have to the extent that we can do so in a, in a COVID environment and in this financial environment. So as we go forward, I think these are, you probably have a lot of questions, but as, as the policy makers, I think things that you wanna be mulling over even now, between now and next week, but also over the course of the time is, is did, did, did we get it right with the one year horizon? Uh, or should we be thinking about something different? And if you conclude that it should be something different, um, we can try to work on that. But this is, we have one of the nice things about being a little ahead of time is, we, we have a little bit of time, not, not endless time, but a little bit of time to look at small turnovers. Are the funding priorities properly balanced? You know, did we get it right with how, where we chose to, to make our decisions? Um, should there be more in some areas and less in others? Uh, is, is the strategic plan adequately addressed? I mean, we'll give you a, an analysis of that, but uh, did, we, did we do the job you were hoping we would do? And I think this is probably a big one uh, and we talked about this just slightly at the at the capital meeting right before this. But if the money if money starts to come back, maybe federal money comes in, or by by June of next year things are looking better and people are parking and our our you know pilot or our rooms meals and alcohol tax is coming in, pilot is coming in. You know, the, the, we we start looking good financially. What would be some of our priorities for budget restoration? Would it be some of the things we we cut off the list? Would it be other things? How would we prioritize restoring, including, um, you know, trying to maybe build our fund balance up to, to get closer to our, our policy. So those are all kinds of things to be given some thought to. I mean, it'd be one of these weird, this could be a kind of a weird budget year where we're spending as much, talking about as much what, about what, what we will do next as opposed to what we're gonna do now. And then finally, what's the appropriate tax rate for this year? Is it, is it no increase or are you comfortable increasing or should it be decreased uh, because of things? So I think those are, I mean, those are always generally the budget questions, but I think they really loom large this year um, under the circumstances. So um, this says 12 fourths, so that's Friday. So I guess I'm saying this in public now, um, but if it's Monday, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, you'll be getting the normal summary letter with all the detail. You'll be getting all the full budget info that you normally get, uh, including the last two or three year history. You'll be getting the summary charts, circles and arrows and paragraph on the back of each one. You know, um, you'll be getting your organizational charts uh, for each department. Uh, as I mentioned, the analysis of the strategic plan and budget and um, a list of projects, equipment and needs requested but not included. And again, I think the folks on the Capital Committee already saw some of that. Um, but we'll be laying that out so you can get a sense of the demand that's building up from, from la the current year we're in that we had to restrict and then this coming year. So, you know, if you're sitting in your seat right now saying, I don't have enough information to process any of this, you're right, you don't, um, but it's coming and, and, and it's, it's being prepared and it's in, in structure. So um, have no fear, you will have all of this and probably more, you know, we usually, all, all the stuff you normally get, the list of employees and, and, and all those kinds of things. So um, just to lay out our schedule, uh, like I said, the next thing that will happen is you'll, you'll actually get a formal signed budget for me with a recommendation and a proposal. And then next Wednesday, we will have a budget workshop. Um, and I'll probably do a quick 
summary of what the actual numbers, but then we can dive right into it. There's really nothing else on the agenda except housing initiatives, which shouldn't take too long. And then the rest of the evening is budget for as long as you want to go. And then on January 6th, that you recall, remember, you did not, you have to opted right now not to schedule a meeting for December 16th or, of course, December 23rd. Um, so your next meeting after that is January 6th. Um, we certainly could find another date for a budget workshop in between there if you felt it was necessary. On January 13 is the first public hearing. Uh, of all, this is as usual, but you can still also have discussions and changes. And then finally, on the Thursday, the second public hearing, which is also the deadline for uh, petitions, uh, is is on that day. And that's when you have to make the final vote for what goes on the ballot. And then, as mentioned, I think again, also during the capital plan discussion, uh, what we hope to do is follow up with the utility budgets in February. I just put the 10th, but it could be both the 10th and the 24th. Water, sewer, district heat. Those are things that we don't vote on. The only thing voters vote on in town meeting is the tax appropriation. So it's, it's you know, we, we're really on a big schedule to get the general fund done. Technically, we don't set water and sewer rates till June or July, so we often don't do those budgets till later. But our thought was to try to keep them right in sequence while we're in budget mode and just finish those up. And then, of course, on March 2nd, uh, voting early and often, our, our machines will switch the votes to yes. And um, we'll be all set. And then early, early voting starts in mid-February. So that's the basic summary. I'm happy to answer any big, broad questions or take comments or anything else, um, but I know there's not a lot of detail uh, and it, there will be very soon. Yeah. Okay, comments and questions? While you're pondering your questions, I do want to call out um, our team uh, we do this as a group. These, these numbers were developed by everyone together. I would say in a room, but it was a virtual room like this. Um, but we spent a day and we did not, uh, other than knowing the gap we wanted to close, uh, we didn't have a preconceived number for like capital. And so the, the numbers that came up with um, were uh, developed by everybody. So the, capital and, and so everyone's in and then I also want to especially call out Kelly um, this is her first budget with us and uh, it's a complicated one a lot of moving pieces uh, and she's done a great job of keeping track of everything and um, and we will be balancing it all up tomorrow and finishing all this up but it's a, you know it's we have a we have a complicated budget for a small little city and it, it's tougher the first time through and it's even more tough when you're in a pandemic so Thank you. Yes, thank you. We're so grateful. Uh, Lauren, you had a question. Or yeah. comment. Remember, did, did we get clarity on how petitions are going to work this year? Just thinking of how that could interplay with budget, if people are going to be putting items on and we're going to get that the last minute, like how that could feed into. So, so start with petitions every year. Um, that could happen any given year. We could get a petition on the last day and have to put it on. Um, so the difference, I think, sometimes is because they're physical and people are out, you know, we know about them. Someone's taken papers out, you know, maybe someone's asked you on the street, so we have a sense of what's out there. Um, and right now, there is no guidance from the Secretary of State um, saying that anything other than written petitions are allowable. I think it's probably going to be talked about. There's some and you know maybe they will allow electronic signatures uh, this year. I, I don't know, um, but right now there's nothing. I, uh, Jack. Well, what I've heard, I, I checked with the elections division, and what they told me, and I might have mentioned this at a previous meeting, or it might have been in an email to John that uh, candidate petitions are not required this year. Uh, other petitions are not. That requirement is not waived. So. I don't think that they, since those requirements are uh, either 
in charters or in statute, I don't think the uh, Secretary of State is likely to have the authority to uh, change no. that. No, and I think um, I think the question is whether whether uh, electronic signatures on a petition would you can't get a, you can't not have petitions, but do electronic signatures are they sufficient to to satisfy the petition need? And there's no guidance on that yet. Um, the city council obviously always has the authority to place something on the ballot by request of somebody else or by your own. You know, you can, we talked about this at one point, you can even separate things out from this budget and say, hey, you know, we'd like to see this, but we'll see if the voters want to want to do that. That's your choice. Um, I actually, it's interesting. I just had an interaction with or you know, e email conversation with the, the managers in Bennington and Brattleboro who are asking the same questions. Like, what are you doing about petitions? And I think every council is, you know, in this situation where, we don't want to just say, hey, we'll put every, anybody who asks on the ballot because that seems a, a real good chance to just run up the, the tally for people who have never asked for anything. So, um, you know, we might want to think about that. You as a council might want to think about, you know, maybe it's one of these things that if you've been on the ballot before, if you've petitioned successfully before and passed the voters before, then we would consider putting you on the ballot um, without having to do it again. But anybody new, still needs to meet the petition requirement. So, but that would be your choice. Obviously, I think, you know, the notion of having to do face-to-face -face petitions or going door to door does seem like it's not the best plan for this year. So that's a really long-winded way of answering. I'm sorry, Lauren, I didn't mean to take that long. Helpful, thank you. Um, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, no, I guess it was, a, I had a similar question to Lauren's, um, but it, I mean, at least in the past, Bill, isn't it? We, we've not just the, not just if they've petitioned before, but if they've received budget. Um, I know when I was on the cemetery commission, for example, there was one year where we wanted a, a, a bunch of money for, for drainage improvements and city council was not willing to necessarily go along with that. Um, but they did say, we'll put it on a, as a separate petition item. Um, and to which I thought that's the kiss of death and, and it wasn't, we passed it, <laughs> um, which was good because it was an important thing. But I mean, it strikes me that there might be those type of categories of existing city departments, existing allocations, um, prior petitions and those type of items that, you know, would all fit into that sort of similar category of things that we may not want to include in the budget or put separately out to the voters um, in a year like this, um, but that we would feel comfortable doing as opposed to just opening the floodgates to anyone who wants to petition. Or, or avoid. Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is if, if, if you said, we used to have a pop before we created the community fund, you may recall there were a lot of people on the ballot every year. And, and the policy then was if you had petitioned and been on and passed and you were not asking for an increase, you could, the council would just put you on the next year. Um, but it had to be the same amount of money that you'd already petitioned for and successfully passed. And then about eight years into it, the council said, well, maybe we'll make them all petition again, just because, you know, and, and some of them may need different amounts of money. And we did that again. And then it wasn't long after that, that the community fund was created. So I just, you know, if you were to, to use that old policy, you, know, you must have been on by petition, has to pass the voters, and it's for the same amount. There's really only one eligible petitioner and that's Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. They, they did that last year. Um, so, because uh, CVPSA can, if they choose, put themselves on the ballot without us approving it. We have to have our own municipal ballot. Um, but the, um, so, so you could limit the automatic on to, to one group and anybody else would have to petition. So I'm not saying that that's good or bad policy, it's just fact. Fair enough. Other thoughts or comments? 
Uh, Connor. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd just be brief because I think it, it'll be a lot to digest when we get the packet, but I uh, wanted to thank Bill and the staff um, just for including no layoffs in that. You know, it's a, it's a really tough year in our city staff's working so hard. Like the last thing they need to worry about is whether they're going to have a job or not. Um, so I, I think it's very compassionate in that sense. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, it's, it's very creative too. It's uh, not exactly what I thought we'd be looking at there. So thanks very much. Towards one of your questions about, is this the right horizon or is it a more long-term um, issue? I, you know, I'm, I am feeling hopeful uh, with the vaccine coming soon. Um, having said that, I would just guess too that things may uh, continue Actually, I, I would anticipate that things may get worse uh, for uh, businesses, for meals, rooms, and alcohol um, in this current year over the course of this winter. Um, and after that, uh, if if a vaccine does materialize, then I think you're I think you're right. <laughs> I think it it would. And I mean, there are you know a number of different vaccines that are close. I just saw some news that one has been approved in the UK or something. Um, you know, they, it, things are, uh, it, it feels like there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, don't know how fast that end of the tunnel is going to get here. Um, not, not in time for this winter. Um, so, so anyway, just uh, anticipating that it's still going to be um, tough between here and there. Yeah, and, and again, that's, you know, the budget we're in right now and that we're watching really closely. The, the budget we're now talking about doesn't start till July. So it's, it's always tough to forget that sometimes. That we're, right. we're talking about a budget that ends 19 or 20 months from now. 19 months, I guess. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Uh, particularly on those final questions. Also, is there, you know, I, I made a list of some of the information we're going to include, but is if, if, whether it's now or you think of it, um, you want to make sure we, information, specific information we, you want us to include, just let us know because we, we want to give you what you need. I mean, for those of you that have seen the budget books before, you know, I think they're pretty complete, but um, you never know. Jack, go ahead. I don't want to needlessly extend the discussion, but I just do think, you know, we're at the front end of the budget process, budget discussion process, but I do want to praise uh, Bill and the, and Kelly and all the department heads for, uh, for their professionalism at, at coming in at something like this. It's a very, very tough year. And uh, it really shows that we've been, uh, able to uh, have a good team in place to uh, to meet the challenges we're faced with thank you yeah no i credit goes to the team they really worked this up uh, although actually kelly and cameron um, were really instrumental in creating a draft budget for the team to work from so i don't want to forget them that leadership Uh, Dan. Well, one quick question, you know, Bill, when you alluded to the idea that we may want to sneak in a second meeting, you know, alluding to the timeline and schedule, um, in the past, when, when has there been a need for that kind of additional meeting? Um, you know, we've, it's hard to say we've done, you know, part of it is, a lot of it depends on the council, how you want to look at the budget. The last couple of years, we haven't needed it. Um, we've looked at the councils, I think, really stayed focused on the policy issues, the big picture issues, the key decisions, the tax rate, those kind of things. Um, in some years, especially further back, um, you know, council wanted to talk to every single department and hear what was in their budget and not in their, and you know, that's perfectly understandable too. Uh, so, um, 
you know, I, I can remember we used to have Saturday, Saturday budget session from nine to three. We had police, fire, public works, and capital. We did all the big budgets on a Saturday because it took so long, it took, you know, that long to get through them all. And we've kind of gotten away from that. I mean, the department heads are present to answer whatever questions somebody might have about a particular budget. Right. But if you wanted to do a, a, a deeper dive of that kind of review, then we'd need more time. If you want to stay, you know, so I think some of it's where we're and how you want to go. And I just was trying to make sure that if you want more time, there is a couple week window there to find it if you need it. Right. So we, we, we'd want to make that decision pretty early on if we wanted to oh, go for that deeper next dive. Meeting. I'd say you should, by the next meeting, you can get a sense of how deep you want to go and what kind of detail you want to get into. Right. And one other question. I mean, would you characterize this as a, a budget that's aimed at that idea that we're headed towards a recovery? Yes. Um, yeah, okay. that, no, and, and, and as you can see, the, a lot of the hit, you know, we did a big, we froze positions as opposed to really, you know, having to cut and reduce positions. Because if we were cutting, those might not be the six that we were cutting, they, but they were the way to make it work and we figured out ways to make it, make it work and then the heavy cuts to capital and equipment those are things that you know they're kind of one time but we you know this is coupled with what we've done in this current year plus this you know we are piling up a backlog of infrastructure and equipment that we're going to need to deal with probably in the following budget so it's not perfect but if we were thinking that this was going to be a two or three year thing then we'd be, I think I would have been saying, hey, we've, we've got to pave some roads. We've got to, you know, we can't put that off for that long. And we've got to really retool, we've got to rethink about the services we're providing. Some of these have got to go because we can't, we're not, we're going to be at this lower level for a longer period of time. Right. So we came down on the, there's another year and a half or so. Let's, let's get through this. And who knows, maybe more money will come in and we can add some of those projects back in and add some of the equipment back in. You know, you may recall when we did the rescission budget that we're in now, back in was it May we did that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Spring, yeah. May or June. Um, you know, we were talking about, well, if things start coming back in December, we'll start, you know, right now we'd be adding things back. And obviously that, that hasn't happened. So um, we tried to position ourselves to be somewhat optimistic, but we were still covered with our, our worst case scenario too. We, we went pretty hard on, you know, we looked hard at the revenues that we thought might not come in based on what we're learning. So, so the and, only you know, a big federal package where we got like a million dollars would, well, actually it would probably change this year more than it would change next year, but it would so, probably, that would help. But, uh, and just so I understand, I mean, you know, and I'm not asking, I mean, I think that's, that's a strategic risk that, you know, I, I don't think is necessarily wrong, but I just want to fully understand so that, you know, if, if we find ourselves with this budget or some, obviously some, some version of it that we're in next year doesn't turn the corner and we don't see that improvement, um, is this something where you might see either a revisit in the middle of the year? Oh, well, let me, sorry, I'm getting ahead. Maybe the first question is, does that put us in a position then when we're here next December um, in a worse position than we are now? Possibly. I mean, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question to ask, and it's one worth thinking about, which is why I tossed it out there is did we get it right on the, you know, looking at the horizon? I, you know, I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, we would... If we had done something different, we'd probably be sitting here having a few, you know, more projects done. Um, but we'd be looking at lower level of service for a couple of years. Um, and that's, you know, we could still do that. We can still retool this one now. This is right. very starting place. So. Okay, thanks. Connor, go ahead. Yeah, re really small thing, but I saw the library on there. Um, I think it'd be really silly to have the library required to get petition petition signatures? Oh, yeah. after, after we've relieved them the last couple of years, so I don't know when the appropriate time to make like a motion like that is. But uh, no, we again we've we've sort of had. I mean, I think at some point you could make a formal motion or whatever. But we we have 
traditionally with libraries, it's been the same thing that if they if they are not asking for a change in money, an increase in money, then we just put them in the on the ballot. And they they've asked for this, they've asked for flat funding this year. So our assumption was we've already built them in. Our assumption was they're going on the ballot. Just a note about the timing of uh, the build back conversation. Uh, maybe it'll be clearer as we go um, because there may be some things that we disagree about and say, you know, we want to include this. No, we don't want to include this. Okay, so that's got to go. You know, we may land with that conversation on, you know, okay, that particular item is going on on a, a build back list, um, but also feels like that's something that could potentially be addressed after our budget conversations. Um, so just a you know, note about that. Any other comments on this at this point? Okay, well, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, additional that. detail. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. I think this is probably covered in what you're planning to give us that nice extensive list, but just, I think just like to Dan's point, just thinking about however it's presented so that like it's clear in writing, like, like, what are we setting up? What are we, you know, in some kind of like summary form, like these are the problems we're creating with this budget that we're going to have to address. And then like, as we look at our kind of risk tolerance or scenarios, like, you know, if we, if we shaped it differently, like, does that feel like the right risk to take on? given, you know, a lot of unknowns at this moment, but just, I, I don't know, however you can make that clear of like, you know, okay, and like knowing that if like federal dollars came in, where would it be easy to plug? Like, is it, is it like set up the right way to res be responsive to the, the moment or, you know, what, what we might see in a year and, and be wrestling with how easily could we adapt and, and be nimble to that? So I, yep. I think that would be part of it, but just... I think I think we'll have something like that. I mean, and, and frankly, that was kind of some of our thinking that it's pretty easy to just retool a project or buy a piece of equipment, um, you know, as opposed to sort of reinstating a program and going hiring process and not knowing. But if you know, if you, we got a slug of one-time money, we could say, hey, okay, here here are the list, here are the projects that were on the list. Here's the stuff we had, you know, we put off. Let's just go get them now, uh, and. And, and the idea is that we're keeping our service level kind of the same the whole time. And, you know, we, I mean, we talk about federal money and, and um, you know, obviously anything can happen, um, but, you know, timing is, is what it is. In order to meet our town meeting deadline, we have to approve our budget on January 21. And of course, you know, the new president will take office on January 20. So even if something were, new were to happen with, Congress and the president, it's not going to be by the time we finalize our budget. So. Okay, are we, are, uh, are we ready to move on or Jack, was that a hand? And there's no motion necessary. But okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm saying, yeah, let's move on. Okay. All right. Super. Well, thank you again. Um, it's very encouraging. Uh, all right, so on to the COVID updates. Uh, Cameron, take it away. Um, so I, I, before I get into it, I did want to ask if, if this is a format that's still working for the council, and if you would prefer to receive these memos um, in your consent agenda, or if you'd like me to continue to read them. Uh, just a question to ponder. But otherwise, I'll just jump into it. It's okay. I, well, I speaking for myself, I would not mind if they were in the consent agenda. Me too. Okay. Great. Okay. Got, got a bunch of thumbs up there. Um, but Clear nonetheless, direction. what's that, Bill? Clear direction. Okay. <laughs> well, that's all, all right. good. We also, just so um, folks know that are on the call with, uh, or are watching at any point, all of this information is sent out in our weekly report, um, which is available on our website. Um, so all of this information is accessible online through our website at any time. Um, 
So I'll go through it really quick. Um, there were some interesting changes. Uh, the governor did create some new clarifications on his recent guidelines about households not gathering inside or outside in public or private spaces. Um, I think the biggest one that I thought was important is making sure folks knew that if they were in a dangerous or unhealthy situation, they could leave and take shelter with another household. They do not need to continue to quarantine with their families if it's unsafe. Um, and if individuals who live alone need assistance, they can have like a, a buddy family with one other household. Um, uh, the Vermont Department of Health has been urging anyone who attended Sunday service at New Hope Bible Church in Irisburg on November 22nd to get tested. They said they have contacted everyone they think is a contact for that, um, but I do uh, want to, I wanted to announce that. The sc schools have postponed the start of any school sports. Uh, that's sort of in perpetuity for right now until further notice. Also, the schools have started testing 25% uh, of schools to be, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I feel like I got lost in that sentence. Schools em school employees will be tested um, weekly and they're aiming to complete 25% of all the schools each week. Um, cases are up. They remain up. I think we're all very aware of that. Um, there has now officially been 74 deaths in Vermont attributed to COVID-19, which is, is a, a big increase and it's, it's happening very quickly. Uh, Dr. Levine reported that um, the impact of Thanksgiving isn't gonna be seen for another week or so. Um, so they're not sure if, if that's going to influence further restrictions in the future. They're just sort of waiting and seeing. The city hasn't... Mm -hmm. Yes, Jack. Um, Sorry. It's okay. Uh, it, it, do we know? I, I know that the uh, schools, uh, my Montpelier, were asking returning students this week about uh, traveling out of state or having family out of state visit them. Do we have any uh, sense of what the uh, results of that uh, survey uh, have been? Um, they haven't announced that publicly that I've seen uh, yet. I'm not sure if they will, honestly, um, since it is a school by school decision. Mm -hmm. I will look for that. If, if they do, I'll make a note to look for that specific. Thanks. Um, the city hasn't made any updates. We're still closed for the governor's orders. Um, we will allow for um, some appointments as needed. We understand that some people have um, business that can't be put off. So appointments can be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Also, the big, the biggest news from this past week is that they've really upped their, the state has really upped their testing locations and times and availability. So um, I outlined the chart of the local um, uh, locations that people are, can get tested at at different times um, that is available on the healthvermont.gov website where people can um, register or they can call 211. But there are quite a lot. They've opened up um, some spots outside of Barry, so Barry, Northfield, and um, I mean, technically it's Berlin, but the hospital is doing testing now too. You just walk up basically. Um, so that's good. Uh, that's really the updates from this week. A lot of the governor's um, messaging really centered around following the guidance and that cases remain up. Um, so I'm not sure and I don't have any insight on if those guidelines or guidances will change. Uh, normally those announcements are made on Fridays, so we'll see uh, this week. Um, he also started a new hashtag, which I think is very um, interesting. It's a very cheerful one asking families and businesses to uh, decorate our houses and businesses with holiday lights to help Vermont light the way. So. Um, that's a very nice campaign that we can all, you know, do a nice light tour in our socially distanced vehicles. So, does anyone have any specific questions? No. All right. Thank you. That's a fun way to end the night. <laughs> way. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay, so I think that is the end of our regular business. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Donna. No public report. Thank everybody for a very informative meeting. Awesome. Uh, okay, Connor.
I concur with the uh, council member from District One. <laughs> uh, Jay. Uh, one little, one brief thing is uh, thanks to those who have uh, filled out that survey I sent out yesterday around the SRO position. The, those meetings continue on, and if you if you could do that in the next uh, couple of days, I'd appreciate it so we can um, make sure that uh, your voices are heard. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dan. Sure. Um, just two things real quick, and they're kind of related. I had a call from a constituent um, that was asking about the idea of extending permits that may expire um during this sort of covid period if there was some sort of hardship related to construction delay or uh, ability to uh, be, commence work uh, because of covid um and I, I i haven't reached out to mike miller or anything to understand if there's actually any of these permits that would be triggered by it but it seemed like um an interesting so, something to consider especially if somebody has Put in the money effort and time to get a permit uh, zoning or building permit and was delayed because of covid contingencies um, and the other question is um, just in in property tax um, you know whether we um, would accept i think we've traditionally whether our property tax collection process is in line with other communities in terms of if somebody misses a payment, I think we have a policy that any future payments apply to those past payments. And then as opposed to if you miss a payment and you pay the current payment and it goes to that current payment and you just try to catch up on those past payments. I didn't quite necessarily understand the whole concept, but it did, it occurred to me that we may have more of those issues arising. Okay. Um. Um, and you're not looking for answers about that, like right now. No, I'm. I'm just putting out there, sort of seeding. This may be something that um, we may want to consider down the line, and I'm raising them now. That's all. Okay. Uh, Jack. I don't have uh, any any report. I just want to, like uh, Donna and Connor, thank my fellow council members and the members of the public who participated tonight for. Uh, good and constructive and productive meeting and we discussed some issues that could have been uh, difficult and I think uh, it was a great meeting and we're going to be done by 11. There's the answer to your son's question, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, um, Lauren. Yeah, I'll also pass and just thank you all for a thoughtful meeting. Uh, all right, I'm also, oh, Donna, go ahead. I just don't want us to have Jack's yardstick of 11 being good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I hear you there. Um, that's, it's like, it's turning into like a little more regular and it's not, it's not the goal. Um, but uh, hopefully we can, we have fewer things I mean, you know, focusing on the budget, but but generally fewer things um, up, upcoming. But anyway, we'll see. Uh, all right. So for myself, I will also uh, pass. Um, again, also very grateful for you all. Uh, and uh, John. Pass. All right. Bill. Ride the horse the way it's going. I'll pass. <laughs> okay. All right. So. We have nine minutes to spare. Uh, without objection, we will consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have an excellent night. See you later. See you all next week. Yeah. <laughs>